and.org slash presidential libraries. The Centers for Disease Control reports that MRSA staph infections kill nearly 19,000 people a year. Now CDC Director Julie Gerberding testifies about the spread and cause of the drug-resistant infections. Henry Waxman chairs this three-hour House Oversight Committee hearing. Meeting of the committee will please come to order. Today we'll examine a growing threat to public health, the spread of drug-resistant infections. In particular, we'll hear about bacteria called methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, called, some call it MRSA, which you can understand why they'd call it MRSA, or MRSA for short. At the outset, I want to uh, commend Ranking Member Tom Davis for his interest and leadership on this issue. In fact, Mr. Davis was the person who first suggested holding this hearing. Under Mr. Davis's leadership, the committee held multiple hearings on public health preparedness, and we're working together to continue active oversight in this crucial area. MRSA infections can occur anywhere. Traditionally, we have thought of them as confined to hospitals, nursing homes, and other healthcare settings, but now we're learning that drug-resistant staph infections can be contracted at schools and other places where people congregate. This has alarmed parents across the nation. In October, researchers at CDC published a major study in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. The study estimated that there are about 94,000 cases of serious MRSA infections every year in this country, and nearly 14% of these infections are due to exposures in the community. The researchers also estimated that over 18,000 deaths each year are due to MRSA in both the community and healthcare settings. That's far more deaths than previously believed. In fact, it is more deaths each year than caused by AIDS, though it is about half of the number of deaths from influenza. At the same time, we've heard about personal tragedies with MRSA. In the last month alone, two otherwise healthy young people died from MRSA, a 17-year-old boy in Virginia and a 12-year-old boy in Brooklyn. In response to the reports of deaths associated with MRSA infection, many schools have begun to look for cases and to take steps to try to clean their facilities. Since there are 94,000 MRSA infections each year, it is not surprising that school districts across the country have found cases. Parents and the public are rightfully concerned about community-associated MRSA. Mr. Davis and I and other members of the committee share this concern, which is why we're holding this hearing today. We want to understand how to prevent the transmission of drug-resistant staph infections in the community. What steps should schools, gyms, and households be taking to reduce the risk of MRSA infection? Does it actually make sense to try to disinfect entire school districts? We will also examine what the federal government and state and local health officials can do to combat MRSA. We'll hear two messages from our expert witnesses, one reassuring and one worrisome. The reassuring message is that there are simple steps that we can take to protect ourselves and children from this infection. We can limit the spread of MRSA with basic measures like frequent hand washing and keeping wounds covered. Also reassuring is the fact that doctors already have drugs that can treat MRSA and more are in development. The worrisome message is that MRSA is a symptom of a larger problem of drug-resistant infectious disease. This is not a new problem, but in recent years, antibiotic use has increased, which has led to more drug-resistant bacteria. According to the Centers for Disease Control, antibiotic resistance has been called one of the world's most pressing public health problems. Antibiotic use is no longer limited to the appropriate use of fighting antibiotic-sensitive bacterial infections. Unfortunately, antibiotics are inappropriately <clears throat> prescribed for a host of ailments that antibiotics can't actually treat. 
These include certain ear infections and the common cold and flu. Antibiotics have also made it into our food supply, and experts have raised the concern that this, too, could be increasing resistance. Well, this hearing will focus on MRSA, and in particular on MRSA infections in the community. Future hearings will examine other aspects of the growing threat posed by drug-resistant infectious disease. In the spring, the committee will hold a hearing on infections in hospitals where drug resistance is particularly widespread. We'll also have to look at the root causes of antibiotic resistance and consider what we can do to curb the burgeoning use, overuse of antibiotics. Today, we're fortunate to have some of the nation's top experts on MRSA to help us understand the risks of community-based infections. We'll first hear from Dr. Julie Gilberding, the director of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, about federal efforts to address community-associated MRSA. Our second panel, we will hear from Dr. Jim Burns, the Deputy Health Commissioner of Virginia, about Virginia's recent experience with MRSA. We'll also hear from Stephen Waltz, the superintendent of Prince William County Schools, about efforts being taken by school districts to reduce the risk of MRSA infection and to educate parents about MRSA. And from my own district of Los Angeles, Dr. Elizabeth Bancroft, an epidemiologist with the Los Angeles County Health Department, will talk about the public health implications of community-associated MRSA. We'll hear from Dr. Eric Gale, a family practitioner at a community health center in the Bronx. And finally, we will hear from Dr. Robert Daum, a leading expert in community-associated MRSA and a pediatrician who treats children who have become sick from MRSA infections. I hope that the experts before the committee today can help us understand the type of threat we are facing, what steps families, communities, and government should be taking to minimize the risks. I thank all of our witnesses for being here today, and I want to recognize the ranking member of the committee, uh, uh, Congressman Tom Davis, for his opening uh, statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for holding the hearing. And um, on the alarming emergence of antibiotic-resistant uh, staph infections in new settings. Long recognized in healthcare facilities where virulent drug-resistant germs can thrive, invasive MRSA infections have recently been detected in unexpected places and in growing numbers. We requested this hearing to explore the causes, the implications, and appropriate responses to this festering threat, and we appreciate the Committee's timely attention to an important public health concern. According to published comments by one of today's witnesses, old diseases have learned new tricks, with hard-to-treat infectious strains penetrating local schools, athletic venues, prisons, and community centers. The so-called superbug outbreak dominated local news and brought unwelcome but needed attention to the dangers of a microbe that is all around, all around us. In my district in Northern Virginia, at least 20 MRSA cases have been identified in Prince William County. Dr. William Waltz, the superintendent of schools there, has been battling the problem aggressively, monitoring student and faculty health and helping translate obscure medical jargon to an understandably anxious community. He's here to share his firsthand experience with the committee today, and we welcome his testimony. When it comes to assigning blame for the spread of MRSA infections, almost no one comes to the argument with literally clean hands. Overuse of antibiotics and spotty environmental sanitation at healthcare facilities allow superbugs to walk out the door. Once in the community, carriers spread the infection through poor surgical wound care, sharing personal items like razors and inadequate personal hygiene. But there's some good news. In the battle against uh, nature's resilience and guile and spawning drug-resistant germs, we have two disarmingly simple and effective weapons, soap and water. Thorough hand washing and disinfecting commonly used surface areas can be very efficient in limiting the spread of infection. Since the primary route of transmission is direct person-to-person -person contact, a little caution about crowding, skin contact, covering cuts, washing contaminated equipment, and keeping yourself clean all go a long way in fighting MRSA in our midst. This is not the last antibiotic-resistant uh, organism we'll confront, and the emergence of MRSA raises important questions about the reach and sensitivity of disease surveillance and reporting systems. In response to the recent outbreak, the State of Virginia issued an emergency regulation requiring laboratories to report cases of MRSA. Twenty-two other states require MRSA cases to be reported to their public health authorities. 
but this drug-resistant staph infection is not currently included on the list of nationally reportable diseases. We look to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for an analysis of the net benefits and costs of expanding that and other um, sentinel regimes. Protecting the public health requires vigilance and common sense. Whether the rate of, com uh, of community acquired MRSA infections is growing or we are simply getting better at diagnosing existing disease rates, a robust response to the spread of MRSA will help reassure a nervous public and better prepare us for the next superbug. Until a vaccine can provide what pub public health officials call herd immunity against drug resistant germs, information or herd, H E A R D, immunity can be a powerful antibiotic. Every citizen can help fight the MRSA invasion by spreading the word about consistent application of routine personal and institutional hygiene practices. We will hear from the CDC director and a second panel of distinguished experts this morning. We welcome their testimony and look forward for a frank but hopefully not too clinical discussion of a community-based response to a community health uh, problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Davis. We are going to limit the opening statements to just the two of us because of time constraints, but without objection, all members will uh, be given an opportunity to insert an opening statement in the record. Uh, Representative Matheson, who has been a, a very important leader in this whole effort but is not a member of our committee, uh, will be uh, participating in the hearing, and I would like to ask unanimous consent that he be permitted to do so. Uh, our first uh, witness today is the distinguished uh, head of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, Dr. Julie uh, Gerberding. Dr. Gerberding, we want to welcome you to our hearing today. Uh, while it seems awkward to put you under oath, it is the practice of this committee that all witnesses that testify before us uh, testify under oath. So thank you for rising. Do you, uh, uh, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will indicate that you answered in the affirmative. Your prepared statement will be made part of the record in its entirety, and we want to recognize you to make your opening oral presentation. Uh, there is a button on the base of the mic. I am really very happy to have a chance to provide a CDC perspective on this really important health problem. Um, preventable infectious diseases are always an issue. Preventable drug resistant infections are an even more critical public health issue. And this particular problem with methicillin resistant Staph aureus or MRSA in both hospitals and communities is a problem that deserves our full attention. It is always tragic when young healthy people acquire any preventable disease and it upsets the community and the schools and people really do um, get alert to a problem. In this case, this problem is not as new as it seems from the news. It is a problem that actually has been going on for more than a decade. But we are grateful for the chance to shine this bright light on it and hopefully um, think through what else we can do to help prevent such tragic deaths. If I could have my first graphic, I would like to just uh, make a couple of really important framing points. I started my training at San Francisco General Hospital in a laboratory with one of the world's experts on Staph aureus, Dr. Henry Chambers. So I worked with this organism from the very first days of my infectious disease training. And I know this organism, and it is a bad bug. Um, I like to think of it as the cockroach of bacteria because Staph aureus are everywhere. They are survivors. They last long time on surfaces. And it is just about impossible to get rid of them. Staph infections generically are a very important cause of both health care and community acquired blood infections. And when it enters the blood, it causes a high mortality. It is also by far the most common cause of skin and soft tissue infections, the kind of ordinary things that we get, grew up with and that people get whenever they have a skin wound. Antibiotic resistance in Staph aureus emerged from the very beginning of the penicillin era. In the late 50s, early 60s, our nation was mesmerized by the problem of penicillin resistance, Staph aureus, in nurseries and spread into the community. These organisms evolve resistance much faster than we can evolve immunity or evolve new drugs and vaccines to combat them. So they will always be one step ahead of our drugstore. And that is fundamentally the challenge. If we use the antibiotics, we eventually lose their effectiveness. And so the overarching lesson here is that we have got to learn to be much more prudent in our use of antibiotics and only use them when they are absolutely essential. 
On the next graphic, I'm illustrating another very important point about Staph aureus, and that is that it is everywhere. On this graph, we have gone across the United States and screened people's noses for Staph in their nose. And what you can see is that about a third of the people in our country at any given time have Staph aureus in their nose. So if you look to the right of you and look to the left of you, one of the three of you has a good chance of being a carrier of Staph aureus, at least at this moment in time. So it's an everywhere organism, and it isn't the kind of thing that we're going to be able to completely eliminate. But very subtly, this graphic also shows that in 2001, 2002, only a small proportion of our population was carrying the methicillin-resistant staph. And it's only gone up to be about 1.5%. But that is an increase. And it's a statistically important increase. And it represents more than a million people. So we do have this organism colonizing people's noses everywhere around our country every day. And that means that we have to look at it as a generic issue. On the next graphic, I'm showing a report from CDC's MMWR, which we have used to constantly and continuously update people on the problem of Staph aureus. But this is really the first report that identified fatal infections among children who had acquired this community methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. And when this report came out, I think a lot of people were skeptical. They thought, oh, no, no, these kids must have had some connection with the hospital, because that's where most of these drug-resistant organisms are. But in this case, there was no association with the hospital. And it was the sentinel that told us that this bad bug was circulating in the community, and although rare, could certainly, on occasion, cause very serious and fatal diseases in kids. So on the next slide, we had to change our vocabulary. We had to distinguish from the location where bacteria are acquired, i.e., some bacteria are acquired in hospitals, some bacteria are acquired in communities, from the places where infections actually develop. So some infections occur in the hospital, but that bacteria might have been obtained in the community. Some infections occur when people are in the community, but they might have actually picked the bacteria up during their last hospitalization. So it's gotten very complicated to sort out where are they being acquired versus where does the infection actually manifest itself. And part of that is because you can acquire it and carry it for a long period of time before you actually develop the disease. One of the helpful things that by chance has aided our understanding of how these organisms spread is that most of them that are causing this community problem that is the focus of our attention today belong to a particular family. And they have a unique fingerprint. And so we can track them by their fingerprint. It's called the USA 300 strain. But we can track them because they are different from the vast majority of staff that occur in the hospitals. So we're able in our special laboratories to say this particular staff probably arose from the kind that we would see affecting patients in hospitals and long-term care settings, versus this one over here is the pattern that we generally see in the community. Now, of course, they still mix up, because people with community end up going to the hospital, and then that organism could secondarily spread. But we know a lot about these community staph aureus because we can track their fingerprints. And what we've learned about them so far on the next slide is that they are a very common cause of garden variety minor skin and soft tissue infection, which usually doesn't require any treatment at all, just simply cleaning the wound with soap and water or draining it if there's a boil or an abscess. Serious invasive disease, like we're hearing about in the news this week, is fortunately extremely rare. But it is tragic, and it is preventable. And when you look at it over time, it does represent a serious threat. Generally, these community infections occur in healthy people. You don't have to be debilitated or have a chronic disease. They tend to sometimes occur in outbreaks, like athletes that share athletic equipment, are injured with turf burns, or have the kinds of cuts and scrapes that linemen get on the football team. Um, they occur in clusters of Native Americans, Native Alaskans, and Aboriginal Australians. We don't know exactly why that is, but some of it has to do with shared personal items. In one of the Native Alaskan outbreaks, it was related to a sweat houses where the staff were colonizing the benches that people sat in when they were in their communal sweat houses. And so there may have been a tendency to move the staff from one person to another that way. 
And there have been some very serious outbreaks in prisons where people are crowded together, uh, they share toiletries, razors, towels, and in some cases they don't actually have soap. Um, so hygiene in those environments is a very key factor in preventing or promoting transmission. I think the bottom line here is that not all staff are alike. Um, some of them tend to cause worse disease than others. Some are adapted to hospitals. Some are adapted to the community. But all of them can be prevented. And that's um, what I wanted to emphasize in my last graphic. CDC has aggressive programs in the healthcare environment for preventing infections of all types. And we have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that you can drive staph infections down to a minimum, particularly in the invasive ones caused by catheters or that in infect the bloodstream. But we also believe that in the community there's a lot we can do. And I have a number of the educational materials and posters that we've been using for um, schools and coaches and athletes. There's great material on the web. This is out also on the um, uh, education department websites disseminated to schools around the country. Just trying to send the message that we have to get back to basics. As you said, uh, Mr. Chairman, in your, in your opening statement, is hand hygiene. It's not sharing personal materials that could be contaminated with someone's staff. It's taking care of wounds and keeping them covered. It's noticing when a wound looks angry or purulent and then seeking medical attention to be sure that it doesn't require treatment. For doctors, it means when you are going to use an antibiotic for a wound like this, you probably need to culture it so that we know what the organism is and whether it is in the resistant family. And I think one macro um, point to make in the context of these children who have been affected and the concern about the schools is that we need school nurses. Um, in our country today, only about a third of schools have a full-time school nurse. We in the government are depending on schools to be involved in nutrition and fitness, uh, in safety, in hygiene as it pertains to these kinds of problems, in pandemic preparedness, in immunization programs. And our schools just simply don't have access to the health professionals that they need to recognize the prevention tools and to take the steps necessary to protect our children from this and any other health threat that could be emerging among our school children. So that is something I wanted to draw your attention to because it hasn't been part of the conversation so far. And I think it's very, very important for a broad set of health issues, and particularly this one. So thank you for allowing me to have a chance to frame the issues, and I look forward to um, answering your questions. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Let me start off the questioning by asking you, uh, how, how worried should parents be, how worried should people be about getting these um, infections that are resistant to antibiotics? It is, is there a range of infection, and are there some that we need to worry more about than others less about? Well, put it in perspective. Is, is the MRSA the, the tip of the iceberg of uh, more problematic infections? And um, uh, what would you advise parents to do? It is hard to put this into perspective, even for us um, with our expertise. But I think it is important that parents recognize that Kids get scrapes and cuts and minor wound infections all the time. And the vast majority of these are the same that we grew up with and are not a cause for alarm or concern. They need to be handled with common sense. Keep the wound clean, keep it covered, and seek help if it looks bad or gets pussy. Um, but I, I also recognize that when something like this tragedy occurs in your community, it does raise everybody's sensitivity and concern. And we want to assure parents that schools are taking the steps to protect them, but protection also has to occur in the home. Um, there are the same issues around hygiene and hand washing and wound care in our households that we are concerned about in the school. So the common sense back to basics are, are, are the way to manage the threat. Um, and just to not wait if a child has a wound that looks particularly bad, but to get it checked out. So MRSA, it sounds like, is more skin, a skin problem than uh, any other uh, kind of infection. Is that what the, we're concerned about? These community um, MRSA 
-hmm. are almost entirely skin and soft tissue. Mm -hmm. They tend to stay on the surface of the skin. There's some biological reasons for it. The, the bacteria probably has adapted some characteristics along with its resistant that allow it to be particularly good at infecting skin and relatively efficient at being transmitted from one skin problem to another. Um, so the, the bacteria itself is, is, is designed to do this very well. But um, sometimes it does have the trick, uh, the unfortunate trick, of being able to invade more deeply and cause very severe ugly skin infections very quickly, or it can enter the bloodstream and cause infection of the whole blood system, of course, blood poisoning, if you will. And that, of course, is a very, very serious disease and very difficult to treat. Is it also very rare? It is fortunately very, very rare. Um, we don't have complete data for the United States, but we estimate that about 200 children will get a serious MRSA infection. And even of those 200 children who get the bloodstream form of this, the vast majority of them will be treated and survive. So we're not talking about thousands and thousands of kids, but we're talking about some children. And we have to take each one of these children to heart and try to do the prevention steps that will help. Now, I, I cited earlier that uh, th there's a recent Center for Disease Control work that was published in Journal American Medical Association, and there are 94,000 serious MRSA infections each year. There are 18,000 deaths from MRSA, more than from AIDS. Now, when you hear a figure like that, it doesn't sound, to be, that sounds pretty serious, not, not the kind of thing you're describing as being routine. The, the paper um, is a very important first study of the problem, but there is a little bit of apples and oranges mixed in there because it's describing both the community MRSA, that's our focus today, as well as the MRSA that occur in the hospital. So we, we are adding them all together to get the 94,000 figure. That is a high number, and we can bring that number down. In fact, we have some evidence that probably the number of these infections in hospitals is going down because of the emphasis on improving safety in hospitals and preventing some of the underlying causes of these infections. So this study was a, a sent an alarm that it is a big problem, that we need to address it aggressively, but the piece of it that is the discussion we're having today is a small proportion of that 94,000. When we hear about anti antibiotic resistant infections and people dying from those infections, should parents think that that's what's going to happen to their children if they have some contact with a, 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 a bug? A absolutely not. As I mentioned, about a third of the people in this room have staff, and even the non-resistant staff can still cause very, very serious disease. And the vast majority of us will never have a staph infection uh, because we don't have the predisposing conditions or because our immune system is able to, to protect us. So they're everywhere if you look, but they don't cause disease very often. And when they do, they generally cause this very minor form of disease. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Davis. Yeah, could you explain the difference between the community-based MRSA we're talking about and the hospital? I mean, it, are they transferable? Are they mutations of the same? Or are they just are disease that, uh, germs that act the same? This is a, a fascinating um, perspective, and there's some controversies in here. So I'm going to share with you my, my understanding based on my previous work and, and what I've been able to accumulate from experts. But there are people um, who see this a little bit differently. In the hospital, um, the staph aureus have been transmitted there for a long time, and they're resistant to many things besides methicillin. Most of them are resistant to anything we have in the hospital except one or two drugs. So they're highly resistant. That's and I, they're just mutations that have survived. Yeah, I mean, they are the everybody survivors. Everybody else is killed off along the way. Exactly. Because we use so many powerful antibiotics in the hospital that only the survivors persist. Um, I like to think of them as, as, as somewhat weak staff in the sense that they probably aren't as capable of causing disease in healthy people as their sensitive cousins because they've had all this evolutionary pressure to evolve and adapt. And they pay a price for having all this resistance. They're not in their native state. Don't get me wrong. They can still cause very important infections. But they tend to evolve infections in people who have catheters, which allow the staph to crawl into the bloodstream, or people who have to be injected with needles or on dialysis for their diabetes, 
or just people who are generally weakened and, and quite ill. They're vulnerable because they're sick, but they're also in an environment where they have lots of catheters that create an independent way for the staff to gain entry, and they're surrounded by an ecology of staff in the hospital where those hospital strains live. Now, in the community, you don't have those factors. I mean, we're talking about healthy children here, um, and the, the, the community staff are resistant to penicillin and they're resistant to methicillin, but fortunately, they're usually um, very easily treated with other inexpensive garden variety antibiotics. So they haven't had this tremendous pressure to change that we're seeing in the hospital environment. Um, perhaps they're a little bit fitter, meaning they are more robust and they can be more easily transmitted to one healthy person to another. And can if, be more virulent as a result. Well, the virulence is, is tricky, but they do tend to have a particular toxin. It's called the PVL toxin. And most people believe, you'll probably hear from an expert about this soon, Dr. Dom, but most people believe that um, this toxin probably does increase the ability of this, at least USA 300 community strain, to cause more skin disease. What it does is it basically explodes your white blood cells and that you know, surround the infection, and that sets off a cascade of inflammation and pus and the kinds of things that you would associate with a more severe skin infection. Um, whether that's the only explanation or not, we're still learning. Um, about 22 states require that MRSA cases be reported, but it's not a nationwide reporting requirement. Um, I understand that the CDC doctors get data from the states on a voluntary basis. Is that correct? Well, there, there are several ways that we get data, but the information we published was from a set of um, states that we pay to do very thorough and intensive um, surveillance. So that's why we have such confidence that in those areas we have a complete picture on this invasive staph aureus. Part of the reason that we did that was to find out what value would there be in making um, staphylococcal infections reportable. I have a, a bias um, from a CDC perspective that if you measure things, they tend to improve. So I'm always going to lean in the direction of measurement. But the question is not should we measure and report. The question is um, what should we measure and report. We can't report everybody who's got staph in their nose because that would be a third of our nation. We can't report every skin infection that comes in because we just have nothing but reams right. of paper coming in. But we probably could take a look at the value of reporting the invasive infections, the ones that enter the bloodstream or those that cause fatalities. Part of the reason for doing that is that it's an indicator we need to look at where that infection was acquired. Maybe there is a problem with the disinfection of the athletic equipment, or maybe that's the tip of the iceberg of a cluster that we need to engage in so that we can protect other people in the short run and learn things that we can adapt in other similar environments. So the purpose of reporting is mostly to try to intervene in a way that protects other people from infection. Are you, are you satisfied with the reporting requirements, that, that, and, and not requirements, I'd say that the lists that you're getting, that they're accurate? Well, in the, the Sentinel study that we published, I have a great deal of confidence in those data. And the people who did that study now are looking at, okay, we know we can't afford to do this kind of intensive assessment everywhere. That would not be a good use of taxpayers' dollars. So what can we do that's feasible? And as we move into this era of electronic laboratory reporting and electronic health records, reporting will get much easier, much less burdensome. And CDC has actually demonstrated that the tool that we were using for biosense, for surveillance for terrorism attacks, is easily adapted to look at methicillin resistant staph infections. Okay. So we, when you make reporting inexpensive and automatic and not detracting from healthcare providers' times, then we'll be able to, I think, have a conversation about a very robust system that makes sense. Mr. Chairman, can I have just five more seconds? Um, the, the schools are using bleach-based cleansers. Are there other effective cleansers that can be used? There are a number of surface disinfectants that are approved by the Environmental Protection Agency for disinfection, and it's written on the bottle so it's easy for someone who has that responsibility to know whether it's an approved germicide for, and for what and use. That's why school nurses are so exactly, important. Exactly, where, where you need that kind of expertise. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Towns? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you so much for coming and um, 
and sharing, and I would respect the fact that you've been involved in this for so many years. Um, what can you tell us about what causes antibiotic resistance like MRSA? How does this develop in the community? <clears throat> now, bacteria multiply very fast. So they go 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. They, you know, they're just constantly growing. That's their business. And every time they divide, there's a chance that they could make a genetic mistake just by, you know, a, a random chance. Sometimes those genetic mistakes cause them to die. They're lethal. But sometimes those genetic mistakes give them an advantage if they happen to be exposed to an antibiotic. So mutations occur frequently because they're always um, growing. And if you have one resistant bacteria in your body, that bacteria probably will eventually just go away on its own. But if we gave you an antibiotic, that bacteria would survive and the rest would be killed, and then that bacteria would take over and grow 2, 4, 8, 16, 32 and become the dominant bacteria. So it's a process of survival of the fittest. And over time, this happens enough in a population of patients or in a community where there's antibiotic use that you end up switching from most people having the sensitive bacteria to most people having the resistant bacteria. Now, staff also have an, another trick because once they figured out how to do this, you know, to get the genes to create the resistance, um, that gene doesn't stay put and they have developed a very clever strategy for moving that gene in, it's in a little piece of DNA called a cassette and they can transfer it to other staph bacteria that aren't already resistant. So those bacteria don't have to go through the process of evolution. They can just pick up um, this new piece of genetic material because it gives them a selection advantage when they're exposed to antibiotics as well. So one part of it is just evolution of bacteria, but the big piece is that we expose these bacteria to drugs and the survivors are the ones that have the pre-existing capacity to be drug resistant. Right. Dr. Governor, I'm concerned about coaches, in, for instance, uh, in these little leagues and just sort of uh, and really have no idea what's really going on. And when you say that, well, it was posted on the website, these are people who don't have computers. Yeah. You know, what can we do to be able to get information out? I'm concerned about the fact that uh, in I mean, many these areas are the kinds of things that we're sending out to schools um, through the athletic associations. We're working in partnership with organizations that support coaches and trainers and, and athletes, little leagues, those sorts of things. So we're trying to get the information out, and individual schools are picking these things up and also getting them out to the school system. I'm not satisfied that we've gotten this information everywhere that it needs to be. And, and not to harp on the issue of school nurses, but I think, you know, in a school environment, you need somebody who's really thinking about the health aspects of the athletic program or the health aspects of the classroom. And that is a really important resource for making sure that the school's doing the right things um, for athletes or for any other um, potential hazard. Do you feel that we need a national registry? Uh, you know, I'm just sort of thinking that now that we're focusing on this, and I really appreciate the fact, Mr. Chairman, that you and the ranking member you know, are having this hearing, because I think it uh, provides us an opportunity to really focus on this, you know, and um, because I'm wondering, is this been going on for a long time, and now we're beginning to sort of focus on it more, you know, because I can think of my own, in terms of situations of strange deaths with people back over through the years. And I just sort of wondered, you know, wondering, did it have anything to do with, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I'm sort of saying if we don't have a central kind of registry, you know, um, uh, we don't really know in terms of how much is going on. Uh, and it, uh, does that bother you that we don't have a central registry? Well, we want to um, separate the community from the healthcare environment. Right. As in the healthcare environment, CDC has a registry. We have a system to allow us to track infections that occur among patients in hospitals. Um, and several states now are reporting all of their hospital infection data to CDC using this kind of tool. And we hope that soon they'll be reporting it publicly so that if 
we see the results, people will be more motivated to um, do the things necessary to improve. But in the community, it's harder. Um, we have some diseases that are nationally reportable, but I think we're going to be able to do a lot better with that. Again, when our laboratories are connected electronically, this will become something that can be generated automatically and doesn't require someone to fill out a report every time they see a patient with an infection. So we're just on the brink of being able to do this in a much more efficient way so that people in the local health department can know there's a problem in their community as it's emerging. They don't have to wait until in retrospect we figure it out. Mr. Chairman, I see my time has expired, but I still feel that we need to have a central person that's going to be responsible for this. I noticed the state of New Jersey has um, moved forward with legislation. And of course, I think that's really, uh, uh, and I'm sure they're doing it out of frustration, but I think, think it should be done at the federal level. I, I don't disagree with you, and I think it, it should be done at all levels. The health department, the school needs to know what's going on in the school. The local health department needs to understand the community. The state has a great responsibility for prioritizing things in the state, but we do too at CDC, and we, we fund and support, and we create inter national and international guidelines, and yes, we would very much like to be able to have a comprehensive picture of the whole problem, not just the MRSA problem, the whole problem of preventable infectious diseases. Because again, if we measure it, I know we will be able to fix it, but if we don't know the scope and magnitude, it's very difficult to guess where we should put our effort. Thank, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Towns. You uh, said you appreciated our holding this hearing. As I mentioned earlier, this was a, at the suggestion of uh, Representative Tom Davis, but I do want to indicate that the idea was staff driven. <laughs> uh, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing, regardless of whose insistence it was at. Uh, I'd like to characterize uh, not just your testimony, but sort of the picture that you laid out. Uh, and, and because I think I'm hopefully, as a committee on government oversight uh, and the reforms necessary, perhaps should be our name, it will lead to something positive. <clears throat> this is a 50-year-old problem that the finest minds, our physicians and healthcare professionals, have either been unable to successfully end, they've only coped with, uh, and in some cases, uh, since you're still printing a plastic card today that says, you know, get the catheters out, they've been a participant in the delivery of that because a catheter, for example, is not just about, uh, it's a pathway. It's a pathway where fingers touch and, in fact, the person putting it in or adjusting it or taping and retaping may be part of the process, too, that, that, that helps get it there. So our hospitals even though you want to separate these, and I think it's appropriate to separate, it, it's got a number 300. Does that mean there's a 299, a 298, and so on? <laughs> there, there are, there's 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, so they, they. And then there's subgroups. Yeah. There's a lot of these. Yeah. But basically, staff kills more people in America than AIDS. All staff, including all the hospital staffs. More people die in which that's the primary cause leading to their death. So this is not an insignificant problem as a whole. You've been dealing with it for 50 years, and you haven't vaccinated and you haven't successfully killed staff. Nor, from your testimony, do I think you're going to. Is that fair to say? I think it's very unlikely we're going to eliminate staph aureus as a human pathogen, but I do believe that we can have a tremendous impact on the infections that it causes, particularly those infections in healthcare environments. Okay, so, you know, I'm viewing the less sanitary world outside the hospital and saying, okay, we failed in the hospital where essentially ever since we got the curtains out of the operating room, we've been cognizant of these things and trying to fight them. So as much as I, I'd like to believe that every gym locker room is going to get clean based on public awareness, I'm not buying it. Uh, what I am concerned about are what we should be funding your organization or you as an umbrella organization should be working with other organizations to do in the way of vaccine development. Uh, particularly, I'd like you to comment on the impact this could have on the military because they don't have any of the luxuries of really good hygiene at certain times in a war effort. They certainly don't have the ability to spread out and isolate each <laughs> other uh, at will. Uh, and if, in fact, somebody were to use 
the ugliest of staph infection ever found, could they potentially weaponize it? So looking at it from a standpoint of where we put our funding into vaccines, into reserve antibiotics that would be used only in the case of an outbreak or only uh, when uh, we see something where nothing else is working and we want to stop an epidemic, if you will. So I have given you a lot of questions, but I would like you to characterize it because what my concern is we have the 50-year problem that we haven't been able to do anything but work with. It is now out in the community in uh, a less informed and harder to inform, and even if informed and even if they did everything that a doctor would do in or his health care professional team would do in a hospital, you wouldn't do any better than you do in the hospital, which is in some ways a miserable failure since that is where you go to get staph infections that can really be nasty. Can you put it in that light so that we get some inkling, not of what you are doing, which is important, but of what we should be empowering you to do beyond that? I would like to start um, with the perspective of the hospital or the health care environment, because one thing that has changed in about the last five years is that this is becoming unacceptable to have one of these infections in the hospital. And that simple change in attitude is resulting in some phenomenal changes in infection rates. We have in our reporting system um, half of some of our intensive care units have had no staphylococcal infections in the last year. So they truly are eliminating the problem. So it is the like the curtains out of the operating room. So you can do something about it. So I don't want to lose sight of that because um, the key to that is the commitment and the belief that you should not have staph infections when patients come to the hospital. But I think your broader question is really important. Um, our, our vaccine story for staph is not robust. There was a vaccine that went into clinical trial in a very hard to vaccinate population of people, some dialysis patients, and unfortunately the vaccine did not prove to be effective at preventing staph infections in that group. Not many vaccines are effective in people that ill. But we have some prototype work underway, not CDC, but many people have prototype work underway for second generation vaccines, but they are not getting the boost that I would like to see them have. They are not getting the focused attention. And there is actually a very tight coupling here between pandemic influenza and staphylococcus, because one of the things that we have observed is that when children get influenza, they are prone to get complicating bacterial infections. When adults get influenza, they are prone to get complicating pneumonias. Very often it is a staphylococcus pneumonia. So as we are preparing for pandemics and stockpiling antivirals, we have got to think about stockpiling drugs to treat the complicating bacterial infections, including MRSA, since that is likely to be a big killer in the context of any serious outbreak. So the antibiotic pipeline is not robust. It is not robust for anything right now, but it is certainly not robust in this direction. Um, so we need, we need to look at our vaccine uh, pipeline, both in the research that NIH is doing as well as um, the, the work that goes on in the private sector. We need to look at the drug development pipeline. And then I think we have got to think about new approaches. Traditionally, the approach to a bacterial problem was to kill the bacteria. And unfortunately, as I have already said, that results in replacement with a resistant form or substitution with a different player, not necessarily a, a better one. There are novel approaches in investigation right now that don't concentrate on trying to kill the bacteria. They actually concentrate on trying to prevent it from doing damage. And so they are like lasers going in to destroy certain parts of the bacteria as opposed to a bomb that blows the whole thing up. And I, I think those novel you know, next generation strategies are not proven yet, but really something that needs a lot more attention and focus. Um, and and it is exciting to me what I have what I've learned so far, but it is a long, the pipeline is long and it is not very wide. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This was very informative. Thank you, Mr. Issa. Mr. Cummings? Yes. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for your testimony. Um, I just want to, I'm, I'm, this whole thing of hospitals and infections um, should concern all of us. person goes in the hospital trying to say, for example, address a hernia, and the next thing you know, they are sicker than they would have been if they had not gone into the hospital. 
And you said something just a moment ago that I just want to know the extent of it. You said operating rooms have become better at dealing with staff infection. Is that what you said? You said intensive care units. Intensive care units. And what is your measuring tool, number one? And are there best practices? Uh, Johns Hopkins is, is located smack dab in the middle of my district. And I know they had um, some kind of campaign trying to get doctors to do more with regard to washing their hands and things of that nature. But I think we need, I mean, that, that's very significant because you got healthy people who are literally going in and now next, and I'm not just talking about Johns Hopkins, of course, but I'm just saying what, what have you all learned from that, that intensive care, less staff infections, what, what have we learned that we can put out there to, mm -hmm. to transfer to other hospitals? We, we've learned a lot. And um, that little card you have in front of you is a summary of, of some of the science that we have accumulated that define certain best practices that we believe are really critical. So we've learned, first of all, that the most important step is to commit to the concept that it's not okay to have these infections that you've got to do something about and you've got to drive the infection rate down. The second very important um, factor is that you can't just do one thing. You have to take a comprehensive approach and not think that there's a magic bullet. Oh, will I wash our hands more? Or will I screen patients? Those things are not magic bullets. You've got to systematically exhibit the best practices across the board. You've got to control antibiotic use. You've got to get the catheters out of patients because they're the biggest risk factor. And very often, patients have catheters for convenience, not because they actually require them medically for as long as they're left in. But the science that supports these recommendations has been codified in a document called um, the uh, Infection Control Precautions for Multidrug Resistant Organisms. And we have put out the recommendations of what the best practices are. But we've also said, in your hospital, you must measure these things. And if you find that your infection rates are not going down, then you need to do the next generation of interventions, which are even uh, more important. Is that information out to the public? Because one of the things that I've noticed it, just from living is that people seem to be driven by money. So if a hospital has a record of infecting its patients um, and, the, and, and the patients know about it and the patients have choices and in Baltimore you've got 50 million advertisements for hospitals so, uh, hospitals so apparently somebody's competing for patients. It seems as if that would be not only, you know, cause them to say, wait a minute, we're going to lose business. We're going to have some problems if we don't address this. So is there some database that a, a patient could go to? And if there's not, would that be a good idea? It's coming. Uh, more and more states are requiring that this information be reported. And some states are requiring that it be made public right away. Um, the CDC is facilitating that with our tools because we do know how to make these measurements accurate and reliable. But I also want to just read you a headline from something that came out um, in August of 2007 because the headline is, New Medicare Regulations are adopted to reduce hospital infections and medical errors. Medicare will withhold payments to hospitals for failing to keep patients safe. So what CMS is preparing to do is Secretary Levitt's insistence is not paying for things that are avoidable complications of care. I see my time is running out, but let me ask you this. Should, should we in the Congress back that up? Because you've got a Levitt, now you're going to have another secretary in, in a year and a half. You understand what I'm saying? I, I believe are there that things that we ought to be doing? Because this goes to you know, the health of our, 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 our people. And I'm just wondering, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, first of all, these are regulations, I got so that. They, they last um, you know, for a long time once they're enacted. Um, but I, I, I think that I'd like to have a conversation when we would really like to sit down and think, okay, we, we've done this so far, what else could we do to really make this a permanent part of hospital culture? And, and it, for that matter, any healthcare setting, um, so that we are not only relying on best practices in kind of a a proactive way, but there's also a, a, an incentive in that we're aligning the payments that we make for 
care with the quality and safety of the care that's provided. Uh, right now, perversely, if someone has a surgical procedure, they may be reimbursed at a certain rate. If that procedure is complicated by an infection, more money is paid. Well, that's perverse. It doesn't result in a strong incentive to solve the problem. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Uh, uh, Congressman from Tennessee, Mr. Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and um, I, I'm sorry I didn't get to here in time to hear your testimony, but uh, there was a, a, a Washington Post uh, story from October 19th which said uh, that these MRSA staff infections are reaching uh, epidemic levels. And just trying to skim through your testimony, I see that uh, you, you have a, a, a sentence in here that says in 2005 there were 94,360 serious MRSA infections. It, it has this, maybe you've covered this already when I wasn't here, but it has this reached the epidemic levels? And I, I, I think I did hear you say just a minute ago something about some progress or effort, good efforts that were being made, but uh, is this, is this 94,000 number, would that be higher today? And is this going up fast? Or? <clears throat> A short answer, sir, is I don't know because that was the first time we ever took a look that way and we have to repeat it to know whether it's going up or down. But we can make some inferences. Um, Eighty-five percent of those patients in that study were people who acquired their infection in the hospital. And we have from other kinds of information sources the suggestion that hospital infections are going down and that the proportion of them related to this particular bacteria may um, be going down as well. Right now about 8 percent of all preventable infections in hospital are associated with this bug. But on the community side, I believe we would guess that the infections are increasing. Um, I'm saying that because um, AHRQ has data showing that there are more visits for skin and soft tissue infections generically over time and a small proportion of those that actually get swabbed and cultured so we know what the bacteria is, the proportion that are caused by MRSA is increasing. So we suspect there are more skin infections in some communities and that a greater proportion of those may be caused by this organism. But we don't have quite the solid evidence for that. There's a bit of extrapolation in that statement and we need to do more studies to verify that as a broad issue. It's certainly true in certain communities, but we don't know nationally whether that's the case. Um, even as we speak, uh, uh, just uh, this past weekend, um, a member of my staff here came down with a, a staph infection, but they've told, uh, told her that this is not a MRSA staph infection, and they've told my other staff members that they don't need to do anything or no, don't need to be worried. Are there, are there many, many different kinds of staph infections? Yes, there are many different kinds, and that's one of the fascinating things about this bacteria. They're not all alike. Um, we lump them together when we talk about them, but they're independent families of staph, and they behave in different ways. So when we have the specialized laboratory resources, we can predict certain things about a particular strain of staph. For example, if your colleague had a methicillin-sensitive staph, um, it's unlikely to be related to this problem that we're talking about today with these serious infections in healthy kids. Um, but there, there is not always a way to know that up front. I think the most important message is, again, kind of back to basics, um, that you should respect skin and soft tissue infections, um, take care of them, keep them covered, um, try not to touch them, and if you do, be sure you clean your own hands and don't pass your staff on to somebody else. But more importantly, especially in communities where this problem has emerged, to make sure that if you see a wound that's getting angry or filling with pus or the surrounding area is getting redder and redder or the person has a fever, then not to wait and to get right. to the doctor. Well, I, f I first heard about this uh, just a few years ago. Uh, in a meeting with some uh, members of Congress and, and one former member from uh, uh, Missouri told us that uh, a 57-year-old county executive or county mayor of a suburban county to St. Louis had gone into the hospital for some minor surgery and gotten a staph infection and three weeks later he died. And uh, 
since then I've heard and read a lot of things mm -hmm. about this and it's getting kind of, uh, there's a lot of concern about this and so I'm glad we're holding this uh, a hearing. But I will tell you maybe this is a little impolite or unpleasant to bring up at this time, but I remember uh, five or six years ago Dateline had a hidden camera in a men's restroom at uh, one of the major airports and they obscured everybody's faces but they showed that something like two-thirds of the men were leaving the restroom without washing their hands. And uh, everything I read and hear, hand washing is about the best thing that you can do to, to try to hold this down. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think soap and water is you know, the cheapest intervention that we have and extremely effective. Hand hygiene of any kind, the alcohol perhaps, I, I think you have one sitting up there. Um, that's a very important part of just constantly disinfecting your hands. What happens is, um, especially in hospitals, if you touch something that's carrying one of these staff, it's sitting on your fingers. Um, you may not end up carrying it yourself, but you can pick it up and move it someplace else. And that's where the hand washing just becomes so important because you eliminate that transfer. Either if you're a carrier of staff, you protect others. Um, and if you happen to be in an environment where someone else has been um, present with the staff, then you won't um, pass it on to yourself or someone else. I also want to emphasize, however, that this isn't something that's just floating around in the air or, you know, that, you know, we, we, we need to exaggerate the way it's spread. It's spread by very close personal contact and primarily um, the major force of transmission outside the hospital are skin wounds. Well, I think it's important that we call it more attention to this, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Duncan. Uh, Ms. Watson? I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, for having this hearing today. We've all been following the stories uh, in the local area about schools closing down. And I just want you to clarify for us. We see those beautiful, colorful posters that you hope to get out. Uh, when should a school close down and disinfect? What are the signs? Uh, not all schools, you've already made that point, have the health care personnel there, and I don't think they're going to have them in anytime soon. Uh, we found on our desk these cards. Would it be a good thing to send these cards out to every school? Uh, should uh, the school personnel carry these cards? Should we send them home? Uh, when we find one case of staff, should we close down the whole school and disinfect? Can you clarify the procedures for us? Thank you. Um, you know, we have a lot to learn about this, so I'm going to tell you our best perspective right now, and we'll learn more as we investigate behind the scenes. Um, in general, when there is a case of this kind of staff infection in a school, um, it's linked to something like the athletic program or to some um, potential environmental exposure. And it is a signal for schools to take a look at their general housekeeping, and particularly the housekeeping in the gymnasium or the locker rooms or areas where kids who have skin wounds might come in contact with each other. I mean, the wrestling room is a great example of that. The wrestling mat, for example, needs to be properly disinfected at periodic intervals. So this is a point where the schools should review their procedures for environmental hygiene. Um, there's generally no need to go in and disinfect the whole school because that isn't how this organism is transmitted. Um, from a public health perspective. Uh, let me just query that a bit. We don't know but how the it's transmitted. And I was going to ask you about soaps and disinfectants. The, the local well, health officers who are involved. Well, let me just say this so that you can give me a more comprehensive answer. We're talking about schools where children come from all kinds of environments and they're there. Uh, it could be spread through athletic activities. It could be brought from home and so on. Exactly. What guidance do you give the school personnel since we've had two incidents in the surrounding areas. And I'm just wondering, and you mentioned prisons before too, and the fact that some of them don't even have soap. Are there some guidelines that we could send out to our schools? Maybe this ought to be distributed. So can you be a little clearer as to how we can protect, prevent in our schools? 
I, the card that you have is targeted for hospitals, okay. but it would be very easy for us to make a tool like that for schools, and I think that's a great idea, and we'll look around and see how we can afford that, but I think we yeah. can figure out a way to get something um, like that accessible to teachers and trainers and coaches and anybody else who has a stake in, in, in keeping the school a safe and hygienic place. Um, the, the, you asked me the question about closing schools, and I, I don't want the impression to be that if there's a case of this infection that it's necessary to close the school. Sometimes a decision is made to close the school because you do need to pause and buy some time to go in and inspect and understand what happened and also to reassure parents that you are taking every step. So I would never say it's wrong to close a school for a variety of reasons, but it's not necessary, generally speaking, from an infection prevention perspective to do that. It is necessary to assure that the school is, has a proper hygienic environment it, using common sense principles of hygiene. Um, and many have um, presented those. And I have um, you know, these examples of various posters that um, you'll find in a lot of schools already. They are made in collaboration. This one, for example, is with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, the CDC and HHS, and this is you know, for athletics um, on a football team, and these kinds of things are in the locker rooms, and, and reminders of uh, avoiding skin, keep your hands clean, shower after you play a sport, use a clean towel, keep your cuts and scrapes clean. So we're using a multimedia effort to inform students um, as well as schools, but I think we can do a lot more, and I want to be able to do that. So this is an opportunity for us to really have a broad campaign around uh, preventing infections in schools and homes, and MRSA is a good hook for getting that message across. Uh, my time is almost up, and I just want to say this as a former teacher and school psychologist and administrator, I know that current budgets, I'm from the state of California, Current budgets don't allow auxiliary personnel because our constitutions in our states only require two people in a classroom, the student and the teacher. <laughs> so the first to go are the school nurses and other auxiliary personnel. Is it possible that CDC can put out some guidelines to the public health departments in counties throughout the country or to states so that they then will take some action to prevent this. It's awful frightening uh, with the news coverage that we have today to know that young people are contacting the staff, Arias, and they're dying. And I think we can prevent it. And I think, you know, you go into some schools, the toilets are dysfunctional, they don't have soap yeah. in the room. So it might be, you know, we can require of course, we can't do it federally, but they certainly can do it mm -hmm. statewide. Require that there's disinfected soap in every single restroom. We've got to do something so these new growth of pathogens don't take a foothold uh, and uh, spread across this country in an epidemic fashion, which can happen very easily in schools. And thank you so very much. Thank you. My, my mom was a teacher. Most of the members of my family were teachers, and they know exactly what you're talking about in terms of school budget and the priorities that have to occur there. And I, I was impressed when I was learning about the school interface with this problem, how much guidance and evidence has been produced by CDC and Department of Education and many state health departments, but I don't think that we've systematically assured that it's gotten to all the places, to the PTAs, to the parents' groups, and this is a really good reminder for us that we've got to market more effectively what we have and fill in the gaps that we're missing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Mr. Lynch? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also want to thank the ranking member for his work on this, and, and thank you, Dr. Gerberding. Uh, <clears throat> I want to sort of turn, turn the question around a little bit. Uh, if, if, these, if these infections were indeed treatable, if these infections were not, <clears throat> not drug resistant, we wouldn't be here today. And uh, there, there seems to be a, a real uh, history of inaction on the FDA's part to incentivize the development of vaccines and, and other uh, antibiotics that would, would be able to treat these, uh, these new infections. Now, 
The fact of the matter is there are, there are some countries, Mexico, countries in Central America, South America, where you can actually buy antibiotics over the counter like we do, like we do aspirins. And so what, what's happening in those countries is, is there's a breeding ground basically for superbugs because they evolve over time uh, and, and become res resistant to those antibiotics. But there are some things that we're doing in our own country that, that I think are problematic as well. And I wanted to talk to you this morning about uh, some of these uh, antimicrobial soaps. Uh, I have one here. It's, uh, it's a hand sanitizer. This one is Avant, I guess. Uh, it uses ethanol. It has alcohol in it, and it physically disrupts the bacteria on the skin. There's another one out there, Purell, that, that's similar to this. And, uh, and that's fine. It doesn't use antibiotics. But, but there's another one here. This is an antibacterial uh, soft soap. And what's happening is, commercially, uh, some of these uh, producers, manufacturers, are actually capitalizing on the fear that's out there. And uh, this one has uh, uh, trichosan or trichosan in it. And that's a, you know, that's a uh, antibiotic that uh, doesn't need to be in this. But uh, what, what we're fearful of is that uh, this is contributing to the problem and that the more products that are out there that have antibiotics in them and don't need to, uh, it's creating, you know, more, more resistance out there uh, in, in, in the pathogens that we see. So what I, what I want to know is uh, what, what are we doing about this? We, here we are allowing uh, producers, manufacturers in this country to put out stuff that has, uh, you know, antibiotics in it, creating more of a problem. And there are obviously some very, this one has ethanol in it. Uh, you know, it's a green product where uh, it, it's doing the job. I mean, can we ask these people to take this stuff off the, off the market? And, and uh, what is the efficacy of those, those efforts, if any? Let me um, first say that you're bringing up a, a dimension of this is very sophisticated. It's the dimension of the balance between um, pretending that we could possibly live in a sterile environment and common sense that would dictate let's do the sensible things that we learned in kindergarten to try to protect ourselves and others from infections. And I do agree with you from a societal perspective, we're enjoying the uh, marketing of the fear for any number of health hazards that is feeding uh, a lot of unnecessary motivation to use many of these types of products. Um, and right now, we don't have any evidence of resistance emerging to the compounds that are in these products. For example, al alcohol, it would be almost impossible for a bacteria to develop resistance to al alcohol just by the mechanism of how it works. So they are um, relatively unlikely, although with triclosan there's been some a very preliminary worrisome suggestion that certain uh, bacteria are developing the ability to exude it from the cells and they could become resistant. It's not a problem and we've been using these drugs for a long time, these compounds, so um, I'm not going to say it won't happen, but that is not my major concern with them right now. My concern is that we're creating um, an environment where people are misunderstanding the hazards that actually exist and they're misapplying this kind of technology and these kinds of products in ways that actually don't result in better health and in some cases might make matters worse. I mean, just an extreme example of that, if your hands are filthy and you rub some alcohol on it, you're really not cleaning your hands. Um, you may be removing some things, but you're not actually able to disinfect your hands properly, so you need soap and water to be able to accomplish that. So I, I, um, I, I recognize that we're delivering a message that says hand hygiene is important, soap and water, and there is a role for these products. We know from science in hospitals where we've looked at their use and what happens to infections when they're used properly, that they can really be an important contributor to patient safety, but their overuse in other environments is not necessarily constructive and really diverts people from important steps. I have limited time, so let me just ask you the, the other side of this, the, the first uh, question I mentioned. What do we do? I'm working with a group called the Alliance for the Prudent Use of Antibiotics, and they are concerned that, that there aren't enough manufacturers out there that are trying to develop uh, new antibiotics. They say we've got a, a small family of, of uh, tools in our toolbox and, and we, d we need more. 
uh, what are we doing to help that effort uh, to, to have drug manufacturers look at some of this stuff? It may not be the most lucrative stuff, but government does have an ability to incentivize research and development in certain areas. And, mm -hmm. and if you would, would you share with us any, any thoughts on that? Are we doing anything in that direction? Thank you. I'll just say that Dr. Levy from the Alliance is a good friend of mine, and so I'm well aware of the work that's going on with the Alliance, and, and, and there's some very important steps that are being taken there. Um, the, the pipeline for antibiotics is attenuated for a lot of reasons. Um, in part, um, the reasons have to do with the complexities of drug development, the fact that there aren't very many blockbuster ideas around anymore. They've sort of run out of new approaches to defeating these bacteria. And so the great ideas seem to be drying up. I don't believe that that's the end story here, but I think there's been a dramatic attenuation of what's in the pipeline to try to solve these problems. And part of the recognition is that um, these drugs have a shorter and shorter lifespan of utility because the bacteria are so quickly able to develop resistance. And it is so expensive and so legally expensive to try to bring a drug to market that it gets very complicated. But I think we can do more. And as I mentioned, the um, investments that NIH and the private sector are making in completely different approaches that are much more laser in orientation as opposed to blasting the bacteria in orientation. And there's some very exciting and innovative strategies. I personally think for Staph aureus, we need a vaccine. Um, there are people we know are at risk for this infection, and if we can develop a vaccine that prevents invasive disease and reduces um, the infection rate, we will really save lives. And I think we need a concerted and very aggressive effort in that regard. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Doctor. I yield back. Ms. McCullough. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gertebring. I want to just follow, <clears throat> follow up on, a, on a two, two issues about how we go about identifying um, this uh, uh, type of staff that we're talking about today. Um, one of the things that some states have been doing, Minnesota has been doing, and I quote from a Pioneer Press uh, article, one of our newspapers, proposed state guidelines would require hospitals to test all high-risk patients for MRS, uh, isolate those with positive tests, and encourage all workers and visitors to stop the spread of disease by washing their hand. Um, it goes on uh, to, to cite one hospital. Southdale has cut its uh, hospital-acquired infections this year partly because it screens all patients in the intensive care for the presence of uh, um, this before it becomes a problem. All caregivers are paying more attention to infection control and I'm assuming by par uh, 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 caregivers or even including those who will be giving care possibly at home for their instruction on hand washing and that as well. Um, but then it goes on to say that uh, the strains of uh, uh, this in hospitals are so wimpy compared to the strains circulating in the community. And that's what has everybody, I think, really um, you know, with heightened awareness with these unfortunate uh, two, two deaths. Um, but uh, community cases often surface as skin infections in healthy people. Hospital cases often attack patients already weakened by surgery or other illnesses. So I'm just wondering, just, just to make sure that, because we go out and talk to people in the community, um, just so that we're clear. Um, the hospital, uh, what is the, the testing? I saw something just, just for a few seconds on television. It was a nose swab. Um, what is the CDC uh, talking to hospitals about doing to follow up on, on another uh, a Congress member's uh, suggestion? What should we be doing to work with, either with the Governor's Association, State Boards of Health, or with you, uh, so that there's a unified message going out? We don't have so many things tripping over themselves that nothing happens. And then uh, the uh, uh, here again, even with the schools, uh, school nurses are something that I'm very upset that, that we've seen uh, disappear in our schools for a whole host of reasons, mm -hmm. this being one of them. Um, but maybe you could uh, speak to that and what, uh, what the CDC uh, uh, might want Congress to do or not to do to be helpful here again with schools, school nursing, um, school administrators, coaches renewal, coaches certificates, which states uh, certify and offer. What can we do to be helpful 
and what are the types of things that you would want a member of Congress, if a, if a, if a mom came up to me worried about the child in school, if a person came up to me worried about a loved one in a hospital, what do I need to know so that either I point them in the right direction and so that I don't give out misinformation? Let me start with um, prevention in the hospital and other healthcare settings. What, what CDC has done is to bring the best experts together and to really look at the science and the best practices and try to draw conclusions about what do we know is at least the basic set, we call them the tier one recommendations that everybody should do. And we've published those like we do our other infection control guidelines and they are picked up by infection control professionals, which we do have in hospitals, thankfully, um, to um, implement them. What those recommendations say are basically you need to m m measure your problem and you need to reduce it. And if you're not reducing it with the basic recommendations that we've offered, you have to move to a much more aggressive and expensive set of interventions, which include aggressive screening, aggressive isolation, and a variety of other steps. Now, you might ask, why wouldn't we screen and isolate everyone up front? Um, and there are several reasons for that. First of all, the evidence indicates that that's not necessary to drive your infection rates down. There are many hospitals that have seen 60 plus um, percent reduction without taking that particular approach. But more importantly, in hospitals where this has happened, they've been able to show that patients in isolation get less care. And what happens is the doctor doesn't go in as much, the nurses don't go in as much, the bed sores go up, um, the other um, infection and safety problems increase. And so there's a yin and a yang. If you're going to isolate someone, you've got to commit to making sure that you provide the same attention and care that you would be able to provide them if they weren't in a room that was filled with barriers that you had to change your clothes to go in and out of it and so forth. Um, so there are, there are aspects of this from a, a comprehensive approach to patients that I worry about. I also, um, I was a hospital epidemiologist. It was my job to execute these kinds of programs at San Francisco General Hospital. And one of the things that I'm aware of is that um, about 8% of the problem is staff. But there are a whole lot of other bacteria that also cause deadly infections in hospital patients. And you have to have a program that deals with infections, not just with this particular bacteria, if you really want to improve your, your, the safety of your patient um, care. So the problem is much bigger than what we're addressing today, and it takes a comprehensive and a generic solution. Um, but it can be done. And our whole point is do it. Um, and let's measure and report that you're successful while you're at it. Thank you, Ms. McCollum. Uh, Mr. Sarbanes? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for your testimony. I became aware of MRSA uh, when I was first elected last year. A lawyer who was in my law firm um, gave me a like 10-page handwritten discussion of this and sort of handed it to me and said, Nobody's talking about this. You need to know about it. Um, and so when the, when the hearing was called, I was, I was very anxious to come and understand more about the issue. Um, we've had some questions about how the, the uh, various practices um, that are out there that, in, that are increasing the resistance um, to antibiotics are, are something we need to be concerned about. I wanted to focus a little bit on what's being done um, with respect to animal feed and uh, the, uh, the introduction of fairly heavy antibiotic use in animal feed um, and, and within that industry and whether that is contributing to, um, to this kind of resistance. So maybe you could just speak to that. Um, generally and then I have a specific question on that. This has been a, a, a subject of a great deal of scientific scrutiny from people on the agriculture side of the house as well as on the public health side of the house. And I think um, particularly um, deep analysis has been done in some European countries. I believe the evidence strongly indicates that the use of certain antibiotics in animal feed were a major driver for one of our most feared drug-resistant organisms, vancomycin-resistant enterococci, but that there is also an association with 
drug use and animal feed with the emergence of resistance in some other more common um, enteric pathogens like salmonella. And so just as the what, the, what happens in people is if you have an infection and you treat it, eventually the bacteria will learn to be resistant to it. Of course, the same thing happens in the intestinal tract of animals over time. They become resistant to these antibiotics. And the problem is they're not over there and we're over here. We're all mixed together. They're in our food supply. We work with them on farms. We have very intimate contact. That's why most of the new infectious diseases people have developed in the last 20 years have come from animals. So of course, our drug-resistant infections um, could emerge from animals, or the genes that cause that resistance could move from an animal bacteria to a human bacteria. So it is an important issue. And I think in Europe, where they've tackled it in a very systemic way, they've been able to show that you still get good yields from your chicken production or your pork production, that it actually doesn't interfere with the livelihood and productivity of your industry if you do this in a sensible and prudent way. Beyond that, what I can say about the United States and the current status of our own regulations around certain antibiotics and animal feed, I'm not up to date on that, so I'd have to get back with you of the current status, but I know we have taken similar steps in the United States. I appreciate that. There's, there's a, I guess there's an antibiotic that treats meningitis called cetriaxone. And um, there's, there's a very close drug to that which is being used in animal feed called cefquinone. And I mean, meningitis is uh, something that causes obviously high anxiety in, in the public. And right now we're in a position to treat it with this one particular um, antibiotic, or at least it's a key antibiotic in the treatment regimen to combat meningitis. Um, are you concerned that uh, the FDA allowing um, the use of the sefquinone in animal feed could create a problem with the treatment I, I'm, of meningitis? I'm not um, properly briefed on that, so I would need to get back to you for the record on this particular issue. Um, I'll just say, generically speaking, wholesale use of antimicrobials drives drug re resistance. And if we're creating an ecology of resistance that is relevant to human health, then it's a concern to me. Is the FDA, as it's regulating the, um, the use of, an <clears throat> of antibiotics in animal feed, are they working into that analysis? the effect it could have on the antibiotics that are being used to treat human the, the, conditions? We, there are several organizations that have a stake in this, FDA, USDA, CDC among them, but about five years ago, people came together, actually a little bit longer than that now, and, and developed a comprehensive plan for dealing with antimicrobial resistance, which really should be revisited because it was a fantastic, comprehensive um, approach to systematically addressing the problem on a national and international scale. And this was one of the main mm -hmm. issues in that report. And there were 10 federal agencies that contributed to it. It's, it's quite good, and I'll be happy to make it available right. to you. Well, I appreciate that. I know the AMA and the Infectious Disease Society have addressed this issue of sefquinome and their concerns about it and, and are hoping that the FDA will, uh, will regulate against that usage. So be encouraged to hear more information about that. Thank, Thank you. you Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. As I indicated earlier, Mr. Matheson is joining our committee for this hearing. He is on the committee that has legislative jurisdiction over these issues and has been a leader with legislation to deal with resistant strains of, of, of biotics. Mr. Matheson, I want to recognize you for your questions. Well, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, thank you again for the opportunity to uh, participate on this committee's uh, hearing today. Uh, Dr. Gerberdine, I, I want to ask you about uh, the federal response to the problem of, of drug resistance. I, it's not a new problem. In, in 1995, a report from the Office of Technology Assessment said that drug resistance was a growing problem and we needed some basic common sense public health measures to address the issue. In 1998, the Institute of Medicine also put a report out on drug resistance and, and had said some similar things as in the OTA report. And in 1999, the GAO reported that data on resistant bacteria were limited and raised concern that this problem 
might get worse. So in 2000, Congress enacted a law that set up a task force to coordinate federal programs on antimicrobial resistance. I understand that the CDC played an informal leadership role for this, this task force. The task force identified some top priority items like creating a national surveillance program, and that was um, seven years ago. I want to know, um, in your view, um, in the past seven years, has the administration done a good job in addressing this problem and in implementing the recommendations of that task force that was set up? Um, you know, I'd have to go back and look one by one at the recommendations, and I didn't prepare um, that. I was part of that task force, mm -hmm. so I'm very familiar with the process and I, I'm, you know, the experience of bringing 10 agencies together with the whole universe of stakeholders was something that I don't think had ever really been done before in government. And I do know that some aspects of the program were, were, um, were, were funded um, and that uh, my division, the division I initially directed when I came to CDC, was one of the beneficiaries of the investment in the antimicrobial resistance budget line for CDC. So clearly some things have happened, but um, CDC will be uh, working with our other partners to reconvene that task force this uh, winter, and we expect to go line item by line item through it and understand, okay, what did we do, what remains to be done, and where do we go from here, um, what was resourced, what wasn't resourced, what are the gaps, and let's refresh this and get the show on the road. Well, I appreciate that. I'll offer you a couple of gaps. There were key recommendations that the task force made that haven't been implemented, such as a comprehensive national antibiotic resistance surveillance plan. And I think there's still a need to research the most effective um, infection control practices. And I'm glad to hear the task force is going to be coming back together. Um, Dr. Gerberding, as you may know, I've introduced a legislation, and Chairman Waxman's co-sponsored as well, called the STAR Act and it's an effort to strengthen our response to antimicrobial resistance. I, I was just wondering if you've had a chance to review this legislation, and if so, what you think the provisions related to surveillance, prevention, control, and research? Um, yes, I did have a chance to review, and thank you. Um, I, I, I would say that um, there's one perspective that is, is good news and will make this a lot easier, and that is that we're in the process of switching from traditional approaches to surveillance to very contemporary pro approaches to surveillance, relying on electronic medical records and the connectivity that we've created. CDC is, is going to be funding eight enormous contracts with large states or healthcare organizations to be able to utilize anonymized data about various things, including infections and drug-resistant infections that will allow local health officers and state health officers to have much quicker and much more efficient and much, I think, more robust information in a timely way about these problems as they emerge. So the technology now allows us to do something very inexpensively that before we would have had to invest a, a ton of money to even get off the ground. That's exciting and we're doing it. Um, the, the other um, provisions in, in, in the Act, I think, are also reflect a comprehensive approach. And it would be good to compare what's in the proposed legislation with what the task force thinks the priorities are so that we could refresh and stay in lockstep sure. as that moves forward. Well, it, it certainly open any suggestions you have for that legislation as we try to move it forward. So I'd, I'd make that just a thank general you. request of you and interested thank you. in your input. Again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to participate in the hearing. I'll yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Matheson. Mr. Bilbray? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, doctor, as the chairman will, knows, in my previous life before coming here, I supervised the health program for three million people in San Diego County. And obviously my information is very dated, so I would ask you to sort of uh, update me on the latest. Um, one of the issues that we were addressing was um, the creation of these resistant strains through uh, incomplete treatment, antibiotic treatment. Is that still a concern out there about the fact that um, a patient's ceasing treatment after the um, symptoms have left but not completing the entire treatment? Well, that certainly is one of the factors that promotes resistance, incomplete killing of the organism and leaving some of the stragglers around to um, benefit from their uh, reduced susceptibility and, and emerge. That probably has not been an important issue for staph infections, but it probably is an important contributed to some streptococcal infections and some other common community problems. So it, when people are prescribed an antibiotic, they must take it for the duration that the doctor prescribes it. Okay. 
and I, I'm going to say this because I think it's important that the chairman and the committee keep it in mind when we talk about other things was one of the big concerns we had, Mr. Chairman, was that uh, especially in the population of the homeless community where you had mental illness, substance abuse, and basically a feeling not wanting to be under the jurisdiction of anybody, we had a real problem with trying to maintain a lot of the people in the, in the homeless community to finish their treatment. And our, our health department was always concerned about that. And I we were sort of caught in between the, the ability to protect the, the public health but not wanting to step on the civil liberties of, of uh, the homeless. And I think that we almost err so far over to one side because the public's perception of, of civil liberties was so that it doesn't affect us if somebody doesn't finish their treatment. And I think that we need to talk about this openly that, yes, it does. Um, and just as we require people to be vaccinated if they're going to go to school and expose other people's children, we need to be um, a little more outspoken about the fact that even if it means um, uh, requiring people to finish um, uh, treatment, we need to be a little more forceful on that than we have in the past. Um, is that still a legitimate concern? Well, I like to you know, answer questions like this with science, and yep. I can certainly say the quintessential example of a scientific yes is in the case of tuberculosis. You have to finish your tuberculosis treatment in order to be protected from TB and to prevent the emergence of drug resistance, and it's important for the individual, but it's an essential uh, importance to public health as well. So um, to the extent that the science would support aggressive interventions, we would certainly, uh, we would want to go in that direction. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I think you've given us sort of a guidance there that in, in, you know, we need to make sure that our, our civil law and our, our criminal law and our, and our um, resources for treating are reflected by good science and that we make sure that we move into those areas of requiring people to um, uh, finish treatment when and where it's only proven to be needed for the public. Um, health as opposed to doing it universally or to ignore the problem universally, mm -hmm. which is to a large degree, none of us have wanted to take on that tough public relations problem explaining to the media why this person had to be put into custody because they, they were chronic um, violators of the, the you know, they, they mm -hmm. finished the treatment argument. And that's, that's been a concern in that population. Um, and it's one that I think that we just need to be frank and brave enough to, to raise. You're, you're raising an issue that, um, that I think is very important for the committee to understand, and that is the kind of research that you're describing, this very practical research. This isn't the kind of thing that excites people to write R01 NIH grants, um, but this is such important knowledge, and we need mechanisms to be able to ask and answer these very, very down-to-earth, in-the-trenches kind of questions about what's working, what isn't working. It's the application of all this biomedical knowledge in the, in the communities and in the streets, in your case, that we just need to take our science that last step um, so that we can answer these questions. We call it learn-as-you-go research, but it, it's kind of the evaluation and the applied um, evidence to answer the question, well, what's the best way to do this, or what's the harm from taking that step, or what does it cost, or what's the best method for getting things disseminated. And we have some real gaps across the board in all of these issues related to preventable infections and drug resistance where that, you know, whether it's what works in the hospital or what works in the community or what works in the school, we need to get answers so that we're able to provide something other than it's common sense um, when so much is at stake. Thank you, Doctor. And I'll just say is um, one of the great privileges I had as chairman of the county was to go and work one day in a certain department. And when going out into the community with a health expert to um, triage and, you know, and make contact with the, the homeless community specifically for health reasons, that's only through their practical knowledge and their practical application was I able to learn that. that so I hope to be able to bring that to the forum. Um, to the forum. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Bilbrey. Uh, Dr. Gerberding, that uh, completes the questions from the members of the committee. You've done an outstanding job and given us a, a better perspective of this issue, and I thank you so much thank for you. it. We have a second panel that we're going to hear uh, from and question, but uh, we're going to uh, break now and return at uh, noon or soon thereafter as the uh, joint session of the Congress is, uh, has been completed. So we stand in recess until uh, uh, 12 noon. Thank you. Oh, are you?
Second panel, as with the first panel, it is our committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in. So please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? That the record show, may be seated, that each witness answered in the affirmative. I will briefly introduce each witness. Dr. James Byrne is Chief Deputy Commissioner for Public Health at the Virginia Department of Health. Welcome. Dr. Elizabeth Brancroft is a medical epidemiologist from Los Angeles County Department of Health Service. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Robert Dom is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Chicago, welcome. Dr. Eric Gale is a family physician in New York City who practices at a community health center in the Bronx. Dr. Stephen Watts is superintendent of schools in Prince William County, Virginia. It's my district. And of course, he's from uh, the ranking member's district. And, uh, and of course, uh, let me begin with you, uh, uh, Dr. Burns, welcome all of you. Dr. Burns. Uh, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee, um, I'm honored to be testifying before you today, and I would like to thank the chair and the committee members for convening this hearing on a very timely public health topic and for providing Virginia with the opportunity to, to discuss the public health impact of community-acquired methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. The recent death of a teenager in Virginia and the closing of several schools as a result attracted intense media interest in MRSA, the likes of which we have not seen in Virginia since we had three cases of inhalational anthrax in 2001. We were contacted by numerous local, state, and national news organizations, and our central office staff and local health directors gave countless interviews. Conservatively, we spent more than 2,000 staff hours over two weeks on this issue. Community concerns were not limited to parents and students. A local office of the Department of Motor Vehicles closed when an employee was reported to have a MRSA infection on her arm. The closure was despite the recommendation of her physician and the health department to not close the office. In addition to many individual contacts with the media, citizens, local and state officials, and a statewide press briefing, the health department provided many online resources worked with the Department of Education to craft guidance for local school divisions, which was transmitted to them, and worked with the State Human Resources Department to provide guidance to state agencies. And that's in addition to all the individual contacts that the local health departments had with those similar situations at the local level. The messages we have emphasized in our communications are ones that we've heard here today, that in spite of this unfortunate case, serious MRSA infections are generally associated with hospital patients, receiving invasive procedures, and that skin and superficial MRSA infections are generally mild. Also, those wishing to decrease their relatively small chances of becoming sick from MRSA should wash their hands frequently, cover cuts and scrapes until they're healed, avoid contact with other people's wounds and dressings, and to not share personal items such as towels and razors. We emphasize that the spread of MRSA was mostly person to person, so general environmental cleaning is not generally indicated, though cleaning of certain kinds of exercise equipment um, between users and similar measures are reasonable. Among the most frequently asked questions by the public and media was how many MRSA infections occurred in Virginia each year. MRSA was not a reportable disease and we could not answer that question. There was intense interest at all levels of the government in introducing legislation to address the public's concern. Governor Kane determined that the most appropriate and the most effective strategy was for the health commissioner to use his existing statutory authority to add MRSA to the list of disease, diseases required to be reported by laboratories. An emergency regulation was issued by the commissioner on October 24th to establish this goal. 
Antibiotic resistance has been our, on our radar screen in Virginia for many years. Beginning in 2000, the Virginia Department of Health began working with the Centers for Disease Control and managed care providers in Virginia on an antibiotic resistance prevention program designed in two parts, a public education campaign and a health provider campaign. The public education campaign focused on convincing patients not to ask for antibiotics when they went to a doctor with respiratory infections and emphasized the importance of finishing the entire course of antibiotics. We also evaluated physicians' prescribing patterns for pharyngitis, usually a viral infection not requiring antibiotics, and we were able to show a statistically significant decrease in those inappropriate prescriptions. The campaign received national recognition at the National Press Club in April of 2001. We receive grant funding from the CDC to support this effort, and our campaign continues today through a partnership with Anthem Foundation, that's the Blue Cross Blue Shield company in Virginia, and the Medical Society of Virginia Foundation. We believe that such a campaign in every state would be useful in reversing, or at least slowing, the troubling trend towards increasing drug resistance. I would be remiss without taking this opportunity to thank the many health department employees in our local offices, the Office of Epidemiology, and the Office of Public Information who worked so hard to determine that there was no increased risk to the public as a result of this unfortunate case and to communicate accurate and timely information to all requesting it. I also deeply appreciate the support provided by the Association of State and Ter Territorial Health Officials and the great support provided by our colleagues at the Centers for Disease Control. Thank you. All right. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Burns. Um, Dr. Bancroft, we'll hear from you now. Thank you. I am pleased to be here to present a public health context of community MRSA. As has well been testified earlier today, the recent CDC study estimated there's an approximately 94,000 invasive infections of MRSA in the United States each year. And this is greater than the combined number of infections caused by the most invasive bacterial uh, organisms that we commonly follow in public health, including group A strep and pneumococcal disease, which is another important antibiotic resistant infection. Furthermore, the number of estimated deaths associated with MRSA, approximately 18,000, exceeds the number of deaths due to HIV AIDS, though all of those deaths with MRSA may not have actually been due to that organism. On the other hand, the estimated number of deaths due to MRSA is only half the estimated number of deaths due to influenza in the United States to help put this disease into perspective. Community MRSA has been well described, occurs in those who have not had any significant exposure to health care in the year prior to their infection. It comprises only 14 percent of all invasive MRSA infections and has a rate of infection in the community, at least for the invasive kind, within the, within the range of other significant community organisms. Furthermore, only 6 percent of community MRSA cases results in invasive disease. The vast majority of community MRSA cases are skin and soft tissue infections, and many of these infections can be cured by a simple drainage procedure and may not even require antibiotics. In fact, we would prefer that doctors hold off on treating many of these cases with antibiotics so as not to have the organism develop further resistance to the antibiotics. Despite all the media attention on children with MRSA, the two CDC studies have demonstrated that school-aged children, 2 to 17 years, are at lowest risk for being diagnosed with community MRSA, at lowest risk for having invasive disease due to community MRSA, and at lowest risk for dying due to, due to community MRSA. So while the media attention is understandable on the children, the children actually have the lowest risk of acquiring this disease. Though community MRSA is relatively benign compared to healthcare MRSA, outbreaks of skin infections due to this organism tax the public health system, as you can see what happened in Virginia. In Los Angeles County, we've been addressing community MRSA since 2002, when we first investigated outbreaks of skin infections due to this organism in diverse settings, including the jail, men who have sex with men, and an athletic team. We have developed extensive health education for consumers and health care workers, including some really gross pictures of skin infections in order to get people's attention. In conjunction with the CDC, we developed guidelines for preventing the spread of staph in community settings. And back in 2004, we actually disseminated those prevention guidelines to homeless shelters, schools, and gyms. 
Though there has been a lot of media attention on children, our largest outbreak has actually been in the Los Angeles County Jail, where more than 3,000 cases of MRSA skin infections have been diagnosed in each of the past several years. The county has spent literally millions of dollars trying to reduce the spread of MRSA in the jail, and only now, after five years, are we seeing a leveling off of these infections, though I doubt we're actually going to um, completely eliminate these infections because of the close, crowded living conditions in the jail, because of the substandard hygiene that's often in a jail, and because these infections are often reintroduced into the jail by people in the community who have the infection and bring it into the jail. We separately, we've also had to address concerns by firefighters, police, paramedics, social workers, and sheriff deputies, and other first responders who are worried about getting this infection on the job. For example, I recently had a call by a social worker who refused to go into the home of a foster child because that child had MRSA. So there's a lot of hysteria surrounding this disease, especially in our first responders. Controlling community MRSA, as you have heard, or any outbreak of skin infections is not rocket science. We know the basics, hand washing, maintaining good hygiene, limiting sharing of personal items, and keeping draining infections covered with a clean, dry bandage. However, there are still questions as to the role of the environment and the transmission of this infection. If and when to perform surveillance for MRSA, for MRSA there's many pros and cons to performing surveillance and how best to control outbreaks with minimal interventions and maximal impact. And we want and are looking forward to working with CDC and other public health agencies to address these questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bancroft. Uh, Dr. Dom. Good afternoon. Um, I'm to have this opportunity to communicate with you about what I consider to be epidemic I apologize. Can I start again? Um, I am delighted to have this opportunity to communicate information regarding what I consider to be epidemic community-associated MRSA disease in Chicago and in most locales in the United States. Uh, I'm a pediatrician. Um, I take care of patients, uh, children, uh, with MRSA and severe MRSA infections um, uh, all the time. I also have a laboratory where I look at both basic and applied research questions uh, related to MRSA. Um, I'm here today uh, on my own support uh, because I feel that this is an important question that uh, uh, should be sort of discussed and dealt with. It's important to recognize that uh, I've been in practice, uh, in hospital-based infectious disease practice in pediatrics since 1978. And I have never seen anything like what I've seen in the last decade. The problem is here. It's certainly not going away. In the last six weeks at our institution alone, we admitted five children to the hospital with severe invasive MRSA infections uh, that require prolonged stays in the hospital, prolonged antibiotics, and prolonged use of medical resources. When MRSA was first recognized in 1960, shortly after the introduction of it as an antibiotic, uh, we had the good luck of having it remain confined largely to healthcare environments. But the situation changed dramatically in the mid-1990s when we started noticing MRSA infections in perfectly healthy children uh, and adults in the community who had not had any health care exposure at all. Uh, these infections might be just skin and soft tissue infections for the most part, and that's true, uh, but in fact, um, um, they are frequent and often require hospitalization for aggressive surgical drainage and prolonged antibiotics. What we realized fairly shortly after the onset of this epidemic in the community um, around the year 2000 was that the MRSA strains that were in the community were not what everybody thought was happening at first, and that is to say the hospital strains migrating out into the community. These were novel strains that had arisen in the community, and they're both uh, uh, antibiotic resistant uh, and they have virulence factors and virulence properties that the hospital strains uh, does not have. It's important to understand that nothing's black and white, and the hospital strains have migrated out into the community to some extent. But what's driving epidemic disease at our center and in most centers around the United States uh, is, in fact, these novel strains uh, that are out in the community. Work is going on is to try and identify uh, uh, what uh, the toxins are, what the genes are that these novel strains have that are able to make it cause severe disease, uh, but to date they have not been found. I'd like to call attention to a couple of slides very quickly that I brought. This is um, my assistance concept of a pyramid. 
And you can see that, as you've heard this morning, I won't belabor it, that asymptomatic colonization is the most common manifestation by far, and then skin and soft tissue infection. But at the top of that pyramid is a substantial health burden in both children and adults uh, of severe invasive disease that is really beginning to tax uh, our health care system. Um, we don't know um, uh, a lot of information that we need to know about how this organism is so successful at spreading in the community. Um, household contacts are frequently themselves involved with these MRSA infections, implying that this is a very contagious disease. Other um, examples of close contact situations that you've heard about include daycare centers, military installations, correctional facilities, um, and athletic facilities. Before this MRSA epidemic began, such evidence of spread in these groups was extremely rare and hardly ever described. In addition, there may be some racial and ethnic group predisposition. Native Americans, Pacific Islanders um, um, are two examples of groups that might possibly uh, uh, have some predisposition to this. Careful epidemiology badly needs to be done to determine uh, what the exact risk of various members of our community are. Um, we heard this morning that uh, colonization rates asymptomatically are 0.9 or 1 or 2 percent. Um, in some institutions where they're having epidemic disease, uh, colonization rates of 9 or 10 percent have been reported. In most U.S. cities, community MRSA is now the most common uh, pathogen isolated from skin and soft tissues presenting to emergency rooms. And USA 300, the so-called community strain, is responsible for 97 percent of them. Um, so if we could see the next slide really briefly um, and, and hit the first uh, PowerPoint, whatever. The, this, necrotizing pneumonia is one of the severe community syndromes. That's normal lung on the left. It looks like a sponge. Those white spaces are where we exchange oxygen. If we could press it again. Uh, this is a child with necrotizing pneumonia who died. Uh, necrotizing pneumonia is all too common with this, and you can see those blue things in the field are staphylococcal colonies, and the red stuff is blood. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a child who died, and with a novel staphylococcal syndrome caused by community MRSA strains, uh, you can see the rash that he had make it look like a kind of meningitis called meningococcal disease that patients uh, and teenagers are known to die from. This is a novel finding that has not been described before among staphylococcal disease. Next. Um, and finally, these patients who die, um, this is the adrenal gland, which is an endocrine gland, sits on top of the kidney, nice normal layers of cells on the right. Uh, next, uh, next, you can see that this is adrenal hemorrhage and this is a mode of death uh, from severe community MRSA disease. This was novel enough to get published in the New England Journal of Medicine before the onset of epidemic community MRSA. This was never seen before. Um, so just to go very briefly to uh, one couple more points. The MRSA epidemic has changed the paradigm of clinical practice. Uh, no longer can we use penicillins and cephalosporins for routine treatment of putative staph infections. We're forced to rely on older drugs like clindamycin and Bactrim now uh, as the frontline drugs. These drugs have not been adequately evaluated for community MRSA. Uh, they're tough horses to ride. They're old antibiotics. Vancomycin, the so-called antibiotic of last resort, used to treat uh, inpatients with uh, severe community MRSA disease that needs hospitalization, uh, is starting to erode with global decrease in resistance noted across the country. Um, screening tests, people have been desperate enough to do something about this that they felt like they have to institute procedures that don't make a lot of sense to me personally. Um, screening tests uh, performed uh, at the entrance to the hospital. Um, the epicenter of community MRSA has not, is no longer in the hospital. We spent the morning talking about it, but the problem has now shifted to the community. Identifying carriers at the door of the hospital has created a lot of anxiety among people that are colonized and not sick. They call and they email me, what should they do now? We have no answers for them. We don't know what the uh, 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 notion is that someone is identified as a carrier, what their disease attack rate is. Uh, if that's for me, I just want to finish. Um, <laughs> um, I just want to finish by saying that I think this is the epidemic now. 
Uh, this is not uh, like bird flu, which I'm not denigrating the importance of that, which is something we do need to work on and prepare for, but this is happening now. Dr. Bancroft and the CDC authors of the JAMA paper concluded that this is a major and enormous public health burden. We need to fill the resources in with the multiple information gaps with how MRSA is spreading in our community. We don't know how that's happening and we have a lot, a lot of missing information. Both the NIH and the CDC, in my opinion, have to massively increase their agenda uh, and fund uh, uh, efforts to control this infection. The STAR Act is part of the Infectious Disease Society of America initiative. Uh, will go a long way to fill in this huge amount of missing information. I apologize for going over and thank you very much. All right, thank you. The Waltz. On behalf of Prince William County 72,006. Okay. On behalf of Prince William County, 72,654 students and their families, our 10,000 employees, our school board, and our community, I thank the members of the House of Representatives Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, and in particular, Ranking Minority Member Tom Davis for inviting me to speak with you today. I'm going to give you a first-hand account from the perspective of a school system and a school superintendent on dealing with the drug-resistant MRSA, which has affected us as the second largest school division in the state of Virginia. I'm sure that I speak for every public school superintendent when I say that safety and security of our students is of the utmost importance. Without a safe learning environment, teaching and learning cannot happen. When most of us grew up, safety and school were synonymous. Uh, that's changed a little bit over the last 10 years and we can take nothing for granted. Talking about safety from senseless and desperate acts of violence to infectious diseases, school personnel have had to renew their diligence in keeping their environments safe. This is obviously a challenge as most of our employees are teachers and are in roles that directly support instruction. We are not in the law enforcement business, nor are we of the medical profession, although we do have a number of school nurses who quietly perform heroic tasks each and every day. So we have to lean heavily on our partnerships that we've established with other agencies, as for the most part, those partnerships are working well. And then there's the challenge of making sure we're keeping our parents and our school communities and our larger public informed about what's going on in the school division. Of course, this ranges from many positive recognitions and awards to urgent communications, such as we faced with the increase of MRSA cases. As I know you're aware, in addition to the legal implications, there's a delicate balance that we are required uh, to walk from communications, privacy issues, and the creation of public hysteria, which is pretty easy to happen with medical matters. In Prince William County Schools, as of Friday, November 2nd, we have 21 documented cases of MRSA, with seven cases still considered open, meaning the student or employee has not received clearance from their doctor to return to school. And although we weren't required to do this, we began voluntarily reporting these statistics as a public service. While we feel this is our responsibility to our public, unfortunately, there are some negative consequences to this. We do not know that any of these cases were actually contracted at our schools, but because we are reporting that people have the infection, the public may naturally make assumptions like these were caught at school and inadequate cleaning was a source of the infection. Like the flu, it's virtually impossible to know exactly where someone picked up the infection. But I can assure you we are very diligent with our cleaning practices and I'm confident we're doing everything we can to keep our schools and facilities free of MRSA. The challenge and response, uh, there's an excellent summary on our website www.pwcs.edu under announcements. There's a lot of information there and you can see exactly what we've been communicating to our public. Initially, two athletic related cases of MRSA showed up within about a week of each other in mid-September at one of our 10 high schools. It's not uncommon for one or two cases to show up in a school environment each year. So this did not seem to be out of the ordinary. 
In fact, our athletic trainers have been on the leading edge of preventing and treating MRSA since the athletic community was an area where this topic first became an issue. The school news nurse and the athletic trainer sent a letter home to parents of the sports team involved informing them of the case and providing tips and precautions they should take. We also had an employee at a different school report a case of MRSA during the same time frame. About two weeks went by and then a student in another school reported a case of MRSA and it just went on and on and on. The following week, a student in Virginia, not in our school division, actually died of MRSA, which greatly incre increased the public awareness of this. And then uh, there were other cases that were generated and the school again not in Prince William County, closed. So around the October 17th through 19th, we had five more reported cases in Prince William County and it was all over the national news media. So issues began to surface rapidly. We triggered a comprehensive division communication plan and we've had countless staff members and departments basically working on this seven days a week for the past three weeks. I'm pleased to say that we are diligently communicating with our public and we daily update on our website each afternoon all the established cases. We also have standards and protocols for each of our 86 schools. So if a case arises, the principal can quickly put on a telephone recording, automated message, send home a letter to the students, post the information to their school website and work with us centrally to update our school division website. We have a lot of cleaning protocols uh, that we use. We are paying particular attention to areas such as gyms, showers, locker rooms, desktops, water fountains, doorknobs, and panic bars. We are following the procedures and our schools are being disinfected as they are being cleaned nightly. Buses at schools with known MRSA cases have also been disinfected. Uh, talking a little bit about the health issues, the Virginia Department of State Health have been in close contact with us and we're working with our own medical consultant every step of the way. Our division communication plan focused on good hand washing and included a parent tip sheet and other health related precautions. Unless our school personnel observe an unusual skin lesion firsthand, we're dependent upon the students or their families to inform us of an infection. And in some cases, we were not made aware of this until after the fact. Based on the inquiries of our own health service staff, we discovered that initially some of the students diagnosed with MRSA did not actually have that strain of the disease, but they were being prescribed with the antibiotics anyway. And of course, this strain of staph infection is already resistant to antibiotics, so to be assured that we can confidently communicate to the parents, we need to be confident that the medical community is treating these cases using best medical practice. Because staff in general and the MRSA strain included can be found anywhere at any time, in fact most of us most likely are carrying it on us today, the medical community cannot say definitely that the person infected is MRSA free without reculturing. And from what we know, that is not always being done. However, doctors are clearing students for school because it is not contagious if a sore is not open and since it is not an airborne infection. Since we know that MRSA can spread by contact with an infected open oozing wound, we did decide not to let any students diagnosed with a confirmed case of MRSA participate in sports or physical activity if they had any wound whatsoever. A few final observations. I've asked uh, what could be done to help school divisions in the future to better respond to our communities on such health related issues and I would respond with the following. The government, federal, state, local could help us to serve as a calming force with the public by alleviating unfounded fears, possibly through public safety announcements. Local, state or federal health agencies could be out in front of the media so the media does not end up driving the message without the proper professional guidance and perhaps create a public hysteria in the process. A good example is our working relationship with law enforcement agencies and the media. If a criminal incident occurs at a school, the media asks us school related questions and the law enforcement agency questions pertaining to the criminal nature of the incident. The medical community, uh, CDC, state and county health departments could quickly speak to the facts. 
Could you in the sum case up, Dr. Walsh? Could you sum up? Yes. In the case of MRSA, reinforcing with the public how it is contracted, and even when a student is diagnosed, does not mean the infection was actually contacted at school. So we feel we have communicated our issues well, but we have those suggestions as other ways we could collaborate uh, to work through these kinds of issues in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Walsh. Dr. Gale. Thank you, for the, thank you for the opportunity to address the critical subject of methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA as it is commonly called, specifically in the context of how this affects vulnerable communities like the Bronx and the role that community health centers can play in this regard. I am a family physician who has practiced primary care in the Bronx, New York, for the past nine years, and the Bronx Regional Medical Director for the Institute for Family Health an organization that provides over 75,000 people in New York State, most of them ethnic minorities and the majority on Medicaid or uninsured. I am here today to provide testimony that speaks to the specific needs of my community in respect to MRSA and the critical role that community health centers play in the management of contagious diseases such as this. My most recent contact with community acquired MRSA was June 2007. Let me reassure you, as I reassure my patients, that MRSA has been in the community for many years and has been successfully treated well by community health center physicians, for the most part without much fanfare. MRSA is significant to the health of the individual and to the community, mainly if it goes unrecognized and thus is improperly treated. The problem for community health center physicians is that oftentimes we are called upon to evaluate a patient only after the infection has significantly progressed and the patient is already ill and possibly toxic. This is because community health centers are known as places where people can seek care if they, even if they are uninsured or if they need care in their own language or even if they become ill um, in a crisis. We are truly a major part of what has been termed the community's health care safety net. Community health centers do their best work when they are involved in the prevention of illnesses. One can never do enough in the education of our patients and the public so that once there is a question about any illness or malady, that they know that they need to contact their primary care provider immediately. This is the role that community health centers play and play so well. We are often the first contact for our patients for whatever their health concerns are, but tragically, Many families do not have a medical home, do not have a community health center such as ours to go to. We need to continue to grow and develop these vital community resources so that they are available everywhere. Where else will patients be educated to take care in their personal health, particularly as it relates to communicable diseases? We advise them that if they have open sores or rashes, that they ought not to participate in contact sports activities advise the kids not to share towels in gym, and not to go to school or to work with any contagious illness. With MRSA now seemingly more prevalent, community health centers with electronic health record capabilities can closely monitor the patients they are seeing for possible outbreaks within a particular community and similarly alert community providers of any clusters of infections being seen. With the dramatic media com coverage of this infection, MRSA, there is no better place for the community and for patients to receive important information about this disease and the necessary precautions that one must take than their local community health center. Emergency rooms and hospitals have neither the time nor the opportunity to spend in the education of the patients about proper hygiene techniques, most of which we have heard already today. I would caution all that we need to remember that we are living in times where our communities are constantly being reminded of the many other serious and contagious illnesses that are out there. In communities where there are immigrants from multiple nations and where international travel is common, these include West Nile virus, avian flu, tuberculosis, and the risk for both epidemics and pandemics. Community health centers are the medical home for millions of patients nationally and our patients are provided not only high quality, accessible and affordable health care, but extensive health education. In the case of MRSA, a major role has been the dispersal of large quantities of reassurance. I want to mention one other point in closing. The Institute for Family Health, where I work, 
has installed a state-of-the-art electronic medical record system, which is integrated into the syndromic surveillance system of the New York, Health, New York City Health Department. Every night, all the patient encounter information from the day's visits, stripped of any identifying information, is downloaded to the health department for analysis. The health department looks for any symptoms like rash or boils that might be appearing at a higher than normal frequency that, that day. This kind of sentinel network gives the health department and thus all physicians in the community a jump start on containing an outbreak of infection illness. My patients, your constituents, deserve this type of investment in their health. This can only occur if there is funding provided for electronic medical records in the community health centers, allowing for integration of health, cent health center systems with public health departments to get more accurate and more timely information out to the public. Thank you for listening and for the opportunity to address the committee. Continued support to provide a community health center home for all vulnerable people and to provide information technology in support of the providers who work there will ultimately work to contain any spread of communicable disease in the community and any spread of the panic that may accompany it. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Gill. Let me thank all of you for your excellent uh, testimony. Now we move into the question and um, answer period. And let me start with you, um, uh, Dr. Waltz. Um, you know, when a situation occurs in a school, parents get up in arms. And of course, um, you know, uh, and they will say, well, I'm not taking my son or my daughter back to that school. And of course, others will get involved and say, you should not. And then somebody from the school will indicate the fact that the school is now safe. And then they will say to you, you are not uh, a medical doctor. You are not uh, in a position to evaluate whether or not uh, the school is safe. And uh, how do you handle a situation like that? I mean, uh, because you know we always look at things legislatively, and we want to know if you need any help in terms of legislation. <laughs> <laughs> well, we use a variety of strategies. Uh, we communicate with people in different ways because different ways of communication people can relate to. For example, we have an auto dialer system. Again, it's up to the parent if they choose to be a part of that. But we'll put out a message using that auto dialer system. Uh, we've got a, a very good website where we have a link. In fact, this was our lead story. If you pulled up the Prince William County website during the height of this, that's the leading link. And there again, it would talk about facts related to MRSA, uh, preventative things like the washing of the hands with soap and water, because you almost have to barrage people with a variety of communication uh, methodologies talking about the facts because otherwise they jump to conclusions that are, you know, just simply not helpful. And uh, thinking, for example, that you have to close school down, we were already using the chemicals uh, that schools that have closed to disinfect were using because uh, they weren't using it beforehand. So there was no reason to close schools. But when you see something on the news that some other school division is doing, then uh, you know, you're right. It really gets to uh, almost a public hysteria point of view. Right. We work a lot with the press through this also to help us get the messages out. Of course, some of the issues with that is you never give them enough information fast enough. So that's why we'd like to have uh, more help from health departments and that sort of thing in terms of getting on the front lines of these right. kinds of issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Dom, um, I understand you've done a significant amount of research uh, in this area. And I wanted to learn more about why these infections are becoming resistant. Uh, I also want to understand if this is a situation that is actually getting worse or it is a situation where we have better reporting at the present time. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'll take the first part of the question, uh, uh, first question first. Um, it, it turns out that um, what the community MRSA epidemic represents in my mind is a convergence of antibiotic resistance and virulence. So that the resistance happens by means of a, a small piece of DNA, which we call a cassette, which actually can move from strain to strain. And when it moves from strain to strain, the sensitive strain it lands in becomes a resistant one. 
So the organism is obviously looking to acquire these cassettes because there's lots of antibiotics in our environment and it's better able to survive. But it also turns out that virulence is a factor as well. And so that a strain that receives a cassette becomes a more fit pathogen, better able to survive on our bodies and in our environment if it also has virulence genes that allow it to do so. So what you have here is the uh, really two forces working against us uh, humans, uh, and that is um, that it's both antibiotic resistant and more virulent. So the second part of your question, I think, um, had to do with, can you remind me? I'm uh, sorry. Actually, in terms of a better record reporting, is a better reporting now? Do we have a better reporting period? Yeah, so it was a question, I think it related to how I know it's increasing. We did a study at our institution where in a period of three years in the late 1990s, we showed that it had increased 25-fold at our institution. And that's not as good as population-based data, uh, to be sure, but it does give you a sense of what's going on. At Texas Children's Hospital, Dr. Kaplan and his colleagues have reported a similar very dramatic increase. At Driscoll Children's Hospital in Corpus Christi, uh, they've also counted MRSA infections at the, uh, and it's a dramatic increase. And these are all healthy people, or for the most part, healthy people coming in from the community. So that uh, I think there's at least three uh, institution-based uh, uh, data that I can summon quickly to mind that suggests that uh, it's increasing dramatically. I'll toss in my own clinical experience, if you would, uh, and that is before this started in the late 1990s, I never saw anything like this. I didn't see these severe syndromes I showed you, and I also didn't see children coming by the flocks to have their abscesses drained uh, or getting admitted to the hospital with the rate that they are now. All right. Thank you very much. I yield to the ranking member. Mr. Davis. Thank you, uh, Mr. Towns. Um, Dr. Burns, let me ask you, with regard to the uh, MRSA case in Bedford, it's unclear from your testimony whether the young man succumbed to CA MRSA or HA MRSA. Do you have any definitive answer on that? The I don't have a definitive answer, and as you uh, appreciate, I'm sure better than I, that talking about an individual case creates some HIPAA issues. Um, however, the mother did hold up the death certificate on television, so I think she's kind of um, provided that doc document in the public, and, and that document lists the cause of death as staph aureus sepsis. Um, in an individual case, as we heard this morning, it's virtually impossible to determine where the strain came from, whether it originated in the community and was acquired in the community, whether it originated at the hospital and was acquired in the community, and the various combinations. And um, I'm not sure this individual case would inform our decision making. Certainly, we, we would be more comfortable using a series of cases. And um, gotcha. I, well, I think that's all I can tell I, about I this mean, case. The, the question is if, if you identify a MRSA case, but you, you don't know exactly what kind of strain it is or what antibiotic it's going to respond to. Isn't that correct? Isn't that one of the difficulties in this? Well, uh, you're asking kind of two questions. I'm asking one, anybody one who can the, answer, too. <laughs> you're, you're asking the genetic question and the antibiotic resistance question. By definition, MRSA has been um, grown in the laboratory and antibiotic sensitivity has been determined, so you know it's resistant to methicillin. And usually if you've made that determination, you've done a complete sensitivity on it, so you know other antibiotics that it's both sensitive to and resistant to. The genetic, and that would virtually always be the case when you're culturing staff that you would be doing a sensitivity on it, especially in this day and age. Doing the genetic testing is a completely different issue. That, that, that wouldn't routinely be done for community strains. Okay. Uh, but early diagnosis is important in treatment in some of these cases. Is that fair to say, uh, Dr. McMurphy? Anybody want to we'll take a shot at that? I Dr. would say Dale. that um, it's going to take a couple of days at least because you can look at the, the, the presentation of the case and still not be certain whether or not you're dealing with um, community-acquired MRSA. You have to do the culture and you may presumptively begin treatment but then once the culture and sensitivity comes back and identifies the strain and what medications are the, med the, the, the bacteria is sensitive to, then you can make changes in the management. But uh, I don't think you're going to be able to look at the case and say specifically that it is uh, MRSA. Right. 
Uh, Dr. Waltz, let me just ask on the, your Prince William uh, cases. Uh, you mentioned your testimony, you've had a strong working relationship in place with local law enforcement. That kind of goes with the job out there. I, I've seen that work. Not the same relationship with the public health community and then the relationship with the media. Could you try to describe each of those uh, with you, the public health community, what it was pre-existing, how we are changing that, and then managing the media is a, is a difficult issue in a time like this. I would say with the, uh, with the health community, what, what I would like to see is them stepping up and taking more of a proactive role in helping the community to understand it from a medical perspective. Uh, the preventive care, the, the realities and the factual information around what this is to prevent hysteria because again, you know, as you pointed out, I'm not a medical expert. So when I'm out there delivering all the information from the school division, I think it would be uh, helpful to parents and certainly helpful to us to have the medical experts out there in the same way that we've carved that kind of a relationship with law enforcement. Anytime we have a criminal type of matter, you know, we will talk about it from the education perspective, but then the police cover the criminal perspective. A lot of times we'll even do a, a joint interviews with the press, that sort of thing. So that would be really helpful. Um, right now there hasn't been a lot of that. What, uh, talk to me, the, uh, Dr. Gerberding talked about uh, school nurses and how important they are. Can you give me a school superintendent's perspective uh, where they fit into this and well, I will say absolutely they're critically important. And uh, with the complexities of health care these days and uh, the issues that have occurred in schools, um, the complexities of medications and that sort of thing, I have a lot more confidence when I know that I have a full-time nurse in every school. I wish I could say that we did in Prince William County, but I'm glad to say we have 69 nurses covering 86 schools. And we've increased the numbers of nurses every year pretty dramatically. Um, I'm going to tell you, uh, I'll say before I've even told my own school board, I'm going to be asking for more next year because simply managing these issues over the last few weeks has just put the system on absolute overload. Good. I'll be happy to join a letter in support of that with the new, <laughs> uh, with the new uh, school board. Great. Can I just ask one more question? Um, uh, Dr. Dom, you, you talked about your testimony that MRSA really has not invaded all the regions of the country. Um, uh, which regions are the lucky ones who have been spared at this point? So uh, that's, a, that's a great question, and I don't know every little one, but I can tell you that um, most people believe that we in the Midwest were the first to notice it in the late 1990s. And um, you heard from Dr. Gerberding that um, the four children that died in Minnesota and North Dakota, we actually had described it in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association a year before that. So the Midwest, I think, is blamed or credited with being the first place to really observe uh, this rapid upswing. Um, next, reports became uh, 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 clear from many centers in Texas and the Gulf Coast that they were having the same kind of problem with a greatly increased volume of skin and soft tissue infections with the occasional severe infection and death. Uh, the West Coast appeared to come up to speed next, um, uh, along with Alaska. And the California centers almost up and down the West Coast have had trouble with community MRSA. And curiously, uh, the East Coast, uh, the Northeast in particular, have been the last to sort of come up to speed. But Atlanta now is reporting a huge problem. And we didn't get to see Dr. Gerberding's data this morning, but in her JAMA paper, the city of Baltimore uh, was uh, way uh, was such an outlier in terms of having higher rates than every other region in her network that they actually didn't include them in the mean calculations because they were so high. So I think the important thing with regard to your question is that every place where it comes, it hasn't gone away, and it's coming to new places every day. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Congresswoman Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by, um, indeed, what, what you just said about how the disease just seemed to emerge first in the Midwest, and then uh, you said the West Coast came up to speed. And I know we in the, the East Coast had this um, great knowledge 
to come forward only recently, and you mentioned the 1990s, when it was first noted, of course, we're not talking about the new disease. This isn't like AIDS. This isn't that kind of uh, new thing that everybody ought to believe is the end of the world. And that, therefore, is, is something that uh, we would have thought we would have known of as a nation. That's really my, my question. These statistics, which apparently have emerged for the first time, and I'm, I'm pleased that um, professionals of CDC did the JAMA article that told us about the 90-some thousand um, cases, um, 18,000 deaths, that very troublesome. Um, a disease that's been known for a long time, known to be drug resistant uh, for a long time. My, my interest is in how the public health system works. So, so that, uh, yes, it's very workmanlike, very professional. And I commend CDC for going to a peer review journal, informing the profession. But again, this is not, basically what they told us about was the incident of the disease. Um, the reason I'm particularly concerned, frankly, is that this committee, uh, one of my other committees, the Homeland Security Committee, have been very concerned about how people get to know that they should take precautions in a period when all kinds of, of deliberate uh, carrying of germs could occur. After 9-11, everybody's a, a alert for that possibility. Even have had testimony here about what, turned, what, what began as some attempt by the administration uh, to control, um, to, to, to vaccinate some professionals ahead of time, and that, that stalled. Um, but what I'm, I'm trying to find out um, is whether uh, you believe that, that the present system of monitoring and informing the public uh, is sufficient. Um, when we hear, we do get everybody's attention once someone sits down and does the statistical work, but one is left to wonder whether we are now waiting for the next JAMA article to find whether there is a disease in our midst. Uh, was there, should the CDC have, have told us about what was beginning, maybe this is for Dr. Mancroft, in the Midwest, uh, what uh, it was, is it Dr. Dom's testimony? Uh, then became very visible in the Midwest. Well, I'm sitting over here in the East Coast where there are a lot of folks, and it's become a real issue here only recently. One would wonder why, once you begin to see uh, a, a trend in one part of the country, whether there is a mechanism for alerting people throughout the country, especially when some of what can be done, washing hands or the rest of it, um, would ha might have prevented some of these 18,000 deaths or, 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 or the spread from wherever they occur in hospitals, prisons, wherever they are. So I'm really concerned about the early warning uh, capability of the CDC and whether it's working. Well, speaking as a local public health official, I will say that this, um, this entity of community MRSA has been written up in medical journals and public health journals since the 1990s. And we've been working with CDC since early 2002 when it was first identified in Los Angeles County, as had many other groups. And in fact, the CDC has sponsored um, quite a bit of research on this. Dr. Daum is a recipient of CDC grants researching and looking at the prevalence of this. I think one of the reasons um, it came to such public attention now, where it has been otherwise quite vigorously described in the medical and public health literature, but why it's come to media attention now, was it was almost a perfect maelstrom of information of the JAMA article coming out the same week that a child um, died of MRSA, of community, or what we, we assume to be, but don't know to be, community MRSA in that same week. I think for the well, How might it have happened? How might, how might the, the entire country have become alert 
uh, before We've, before somebody died and we had a kind of crisis atmosphere at least created here for a while? You know, it's, it's a great question because we've been trying to work with the media in Los Angeles County, the school districts, for example, for many years on this. Um, we sent out our guidelines for the prevention of how to prevent spreading this bug back in 2004 to the school districts and have been giving lectures to doctors and well, to school districts. Well, did CDC send out anything at that time? Did CDC this send out anything in the 1990s, for example, when it began to develop in the Midwest? It, it did um, have that MMWR, which is basically a public health notification. It's an official CDC notification um, in 2000 about the deaths that occurred in 1999 in the Midwest. And subsequently, there have been multiple MMWRs and multiple articles in the CDC journal Emerging Infectious Diseases uh, you know, I'm, about I'm, this. You forgive me if I'm trying to find yeah. out whether or not your school superintendent, your congresswoman, your mayors, sure. your lay people who uh, do not have access and will do not want access <laughs> to the right. professional literature uh, were alerted, should have been alerted, whether or not our system in the post-9-11 period has a way to say, nationally, look everybody, there's something out there, it's not a crisis, but this is what is occurring in some parts of our country. Uh, I, the reason I ask this from the point of view of the layman is that we're not talking about something that only doctors can deal with. You tell me that there are precautions we, that children could take in school, that people could take in restaurants, God help us, people can take in uh, in hospitals that I don't think they understood they could take because there was because you were left to, to deal in LA County to hear your to hear your testimony, and others of course dealt as they should have where they were located. This is a nation. We're not dealing with how this hops from one country to another as in Europe. So I'm just trying to find out if you have a national public health health network, is it working here, and what can this committee do to make sure that uh, before there's an outbreak, break, before there's something sensationalized in the paper, so now we got to go into our neighborhoods and say, just a moment, no, no this is not like AIDS, this uh, 18,000 people dying. So then you leave it to, to lay people like us to have to put it back in perspective because there's been no national uh, understanding of what has happened. That is my complaint. Not that they didn't do the professional job, that was excellent what they did. But they didn't tell me, they didn't tell my constituents, uh, they didn't tell the people who come in contact with the very people who may be spreading it. Uh, yeah. Dr. Dom, did you have something you wanted to say? Um, yes, and it's, it, I think the most important message I would like to give um, at this point is that to be constructive about this, and that is to say that um, if you believe the perspective that I've tried to provide, that the epicenter of MRSA is not now in the hospitals, but it's actually in the community, I think you've heard threads of that uh, over and over again, then now Yeah, we have, you know, we have a school, a whole school, and all these kids haven't been in the hospital. I understand. We have our, our jail facilities. We have the households of patients. Uh, we have a lot of evidence of spread to new people, new kinds of folks that weren't really MRSA high-risk people before this began. And so now is the time I How think, did it get out the, of the, the hospital? The gentlewoman's time has expired. I'd be uh, delighted to give us a, a second round. Just but, uh, uh, thank yeah, you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, definitely. Let me move forward. Uh, Councilman Matheson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this hearing. It's not a regular member of the committee, and I'm pleased to have a chance to participate today. Um, Dr. Dom, um, you're probably aware I'm, my wife is a pediatric infectious disease doctor in Salt Lake City, so uh, I have some... She's probably under-supported. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a discussion we, I hear a lot at the family dinner table. Um, I appreciate your being here today and want to ask you a couple of questions. First, it's my understanding that Illinois is the only state in the country that's passed legislation that requires active surveillance of MRSA in hospitals. Do you think that's a model that other states and other countries should be following, or what do you see the strengths and weaknesses of the Illinois model? So first of all, let me begin by saying thank you for being one of the sponsors of the STAR uh, legislation. I think that's an important uh, step to really getting the resources that this community, MRSA and other infectious disease, antibiotic resistance infections uh, really requires of us. Um, I'm not uh, pleased with our law in Illinois. Uh, what's happened, uh, for those that don't know, in the last couple of years is a, a screening test is now available where you can take a swab of someone's nose uh, and determine whether they have a MRSA DNA. 
uh, in, in their nose secretions. And uh, while on the one hand, one could conjure up some valuable things to investigate with that test, um, knowing that the germ or the DNA more properly is in someone's nose uh, does not really inform about the risk for subsequent infection. And so, um, it, first of all, it's a very expensive intervention. It costs several hundred dollars a test. Uh, the bill uh, in Illinois, the, the price of it is being charged to the patients. Mm -hmm. uh, second of all, our law is on admission only to ICUs. Okay. Um, and we've, I've already begun to field phone calls from people who are well, uh, had a positive test, and don't know what to do. They've been to doctors. They can't get rid of it. We don't know what the intervention is to tell someone about with a positive test. There's one, and now a new university hospital in our state is contemplating screening of everyone, standing at the door of the hospital and screening everyone who comes in. And again, you can imagine a healthy woman coming, coming to deliver a baby, uh, gets screened, finds out she's positive, she's perfectly well, and goes crazy with anxiety about what should she do now, and there's no intervention we have. So although at first glance it sounds like it's a good thing to do, and in intensive care units it may have some use in decreasing spread in that high charged environment, the epicenter of the problem is in the community now. Yeah. And screening at the entrance to the hospital is not going to do anything but spend a lot of money and create a lot of anxiety. That's helpful. You mentioned the, the STAR Act that I've, I've introduced along with Congressman Waxman. And uh, um, I was wondering if you could just Describe what you see as the strengths of the bill, and can you speak in particular about the Antimicrobial Resistance Clinical Research and Public Health Network? Yeah, so um, I, I think that MRSA, community MRSA, the epidemic we're having, coupled with other ongoing problems, most of which are at this moment based in hospitals, such as extended spectrum beta lactamases and organisms like Klebsiella, which are nosocomial infections, um, are um, uh, healthcare problems that we've approached in a piecemeal way. And what excites me about the STAR Act is the idea that we as a society um, will take a proactive approach and create uh, centers um, around the country with a central uh, focused uh, office and bureau here um, that will start to proactively look at the magnitude of these issues so that we're not getting a paper like the one that came out in JAMA well into the epidemic and saying, wow, these numbers are really high. We'll know all along. They also provide for uh, novel interventions to try and contain the spread of antimicrobial resistant infections. That part of it excites me as well. And the part that excites me the most is, um, um, and is also part of this, is to create novel uh, research strategies uh, in the lab and at the bedside to understand why resistant organisms are so successful making their way in our community and in our intensive care units uh, with the goal to try to prevent that from happening. Uh, I see this bill as potentially resulting in new therapeutic strategies, new infection control strategies, uh, and ultimately perhaps even new uh, prevention strategies. So I'm very excited about its scope and the idea that it creates a diverse effort from investigators and public health people around the country. Uh, that's very helpful. I, I need to take you around with me when I'm trying to get people to co-sponsor the bill, uh, I think. Let's talk. Um, <laughs> uh, one last quick question. Oh, I, my time's expired. Can I just get one quick one in? Just do, do you feel that right now the federal government has in place an adequate, has the capability to adequately respond to, com ad is able to adequately respond to antimicrobial resistant germs when they manifest themselves somewhere. Do you think the federal government's set up to deal with that right now? You know, I, I think that what the JAMA paper for me was uh, very exciting in that it gave numbers to what I believe I've been seeing clinically for the last 10 years. And the numbers are incredibly high. And um, I believe that this declares what I've been saying is that this is an epidemic. It's an epidemic in our communities of MRSA infections, and they're novel infections. They're not the hospital germs that have moved out into the community. They're new germs. And I think that it gives us a real chance to mobilize. The, I think the mechanisms to answer your question are in place. Uh, NIH knows how to put out notices that we're interested in research in a certain problem. Uh, CDC has begun to more aggressively fund extramural programs uh, and needs to continue to do that to look for better ways to deal with this. So I think that if the agencies that are in place respond 
and say this is an epidemic. This is not about the hospitals. This is not about disinfecting a school or two. This is a major epidemic and we need to understand why and intervene. That yes, the mechanisms are in place, but they need to be resourced. The star bill is a mechanism of doing that. There's probably others. Uh, and they need to be mandated. And I hope that that's what, something that comes out of this hearing today, uh, that we've convinced you that there is an epidemic on, that the epicenter is in the community, and that some of our public institutions, like the jails and the military, uh, are, uh, and the athletic facilities, are clearly involved in this, Brad. We need to understand exactly how. Well, thank if, you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. May I um, add oh, to something that Dr. Dom said, which is I think it's important whether or not the federal uh, to have the federal government have the resources to respond to this epidemic, but also to support the local and state public health resources because we're really the front lines of this epidemic. The first calls come to us when there's a problem, and what we look for to CDC is to help set up the science behind the recommendations that then we will be applying on a regular daily basis. So I appreciate that there needs to be support for the federal government, but also for local and state uh, health centers. Thank you very much. Um, on that note, uh, Dr. Bancroft, do we really have the mechanism in place to determine how many cases, you know? That's, um, that's a great question. Um, as Dr. Gaberding said earlier today, in those areas where they did the surveillance that the JAMA article is based on, yes, they had a great mechanism for determining every case of invasive MRSA. But that um, particular mechanism took a lot of resources. Most of us at local and states don't have that resources to follow every case of MRSA. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Yale, um, isn't there a short window for treating invasive MRSA? You talk about administering a culture. How long will that take? Well, the, the culture and, and uh, identification and sensitivity of um, any bacteria generally takes about three days. Um, and any clinician, if they're suspicious of something that's going on, something that doesn't look quite normal, will begin treatment. Whether the treatment is adequate is going to be determined by the, the sensitivity of the bug. So you basically have three days in which um, you, can, you can start treatment, which could probably quiet the infection but not quite get, get at it to kill it. And then after you identify the, the strain and the sensitivity, change the antibiotic that will effectively um, kill the bacteria. Yeah, doctor, um, thank you. I, I think that Dr. Gale's points are right on the money, and but they apply to the common manifestation of community MRSA, which is the skin and soft tissue infection. And fortunately, that is the commonest manifestation, as I showed you on the slide. I, I just want to remind everybody that fortunately, uncommon, uh, but there is a manifestation of this disease that does not present as a skin and soft tissue infection, but presents as an overwhelming body-wide infection and has the potential to cause death in previously healthy people in 12 to 24 hours. Uh, I showed you a picture of one of the children who died. Uh, I showed you the skin rash and the adrenal glands and the lungs of such a child. Uh, we work with some of the parents who this has happened to because as you might imagine, they're kind of overwhelmed, but there's no uh, quick test to do, your, which is what your question goes to, I think, That's to right. diagnose those children. Our emergency room is on very high alert, as are probably most other ERs now in our country, uh, for these severely ill folks. We have the antibiotics ready to go, the fluids ready to go, the supportive care evidence-based are not ready to go, but the mortality is still high. And that's one of the reasons people have called repeatedly today, and I among them, for a vaccine, because mm -hmm. the tip of the iceberg of this epidemic, fortunately less common, I don't want to be alarmist here, um, kills faster than we can treat it. And it's not just a question about better antibiotics. And I just wanted to emphasize that because it goes to your question. Right. It, it also has changed, the, to come back to Dr. Gale's point like one more time, it's, this epidemic has also changed how we practice medicine. Right. Uh, it used to be we had a skin and soft tissue infection or an abscess and we could take a penicillin or a cephalosporin compound and reliably treat. Didn't need to do a culture. The MRSA epidemic has changed that. We now recommend a culture, 
incision and drainage, as Dr. Bancroft said, but that the antibiotic has to be guessed at, and it takes several days to know whether it's the right choice or not. So it's, and, and it's not a penicillin or a cephalosporin. It's one of these old-timey drugs that we don't even know how well they work. So it isn't about antibiotic resistance in that sense, that it's changed how clinicians must respond to a skin and soft tissue infection now as compared with 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I hope that's helpful. You did, yeah, very yeah. helpful. Let me uh, indicate, uh, let me, well, actually, um, uh, a couple of you indicated that the government should do certain things. And I think you're talking about uh, government agencies. But you know, we're government too. <laughs> and so uh, what specific suggestions do you have to us? And I know you might have some concerns about uh, members of Congress getting their nose under the tent. You know, but uh, I think that, you know, if there's any specific recommendations or suggestions, you know, uh, Congressman Matheson, of course, and Congressman Waxman has a piece of legislation, I think, that uh, we're, you're looking at. And you know, but are there any other suggestions and recommendations that you feel that Congress should be involved in or may, uh, uh, should uh, get involved in legislation of any, any sort? So let's go right down the line. Uh, and. Uh, I know, Dr. Walsh, you've already made your request to your con uh, to your. I've got one more. Hey, oh, yeah, one more. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Burns, so let me just go right down the line. Well, certainly. And I know your situation is a little different. Not surprisingly, my first request would be continued support for health departments at the local level, because that is where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> um, I, I thought it was that almost breathtaking that the Centers for Medicaid uh, and Medicare services did what they did for um, nosocomial acquired infection. So basically they're saying if, uh, if your practices are such that um, you're creating a nosocomial infection in the hospital, again, focus on the hospital, but if, if that happens in the hospital, you're not going to get paid for that patient. Um, I think that's an incredibly powerful tool. I think it sends a, a great message, and I think um, that and the 100,000 Lives campaign are two very effective methods to get the attention of the, of the hospital system. I think it's not as obvious how such a um, kind of simple idea could affect uh, community-acquired infections because it's, um, it's kind of everybody doing what we do that creates the risk. Um, it's back to um, the, the issue about what kind of um, resources do we have to get the public's um, attention. And th I think that's the issue. It's not the fact that people at the federal level, the state level, and the local level aren't trying to get these messages out. But we have an almost limited, unlimited number of public health messages that we want to get out. Mm -hmm. And we're competing with a very noisy and effective um, advertising world where they're trying to get their message out too. So there's a limited capacity for people to hear messages. And it only, it, it tends to happen around something like this where for reasons that I still don't understand, something gets the public's attention and then they start paying attention. And if we could figure out how we could get people to pay attention, um, I think we could be much more effective in getting our messages out. You obviously can't legislate that. <coughs> All right. Dr. Dahman, I'm on, uh I'm on Congressman Davis's time now. Yeah, go ahead. Does that mean I should shouldn't talk, or I should talk fast, or talk fast. no? I take your time. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think there's um, um, a number of things that you can do. Um, the first uh, thing is you've heard uh, from the different vantage points seated at this table, and I think we all have slightly different stakeholders in this problem. Um, that education and the ability to cope with the need for education by the public is a major problem and needs to be resourced and expanded. So that we need to understand better how to react to hearing that a case came from the school or, 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 or that there's screening programs being proposed for the hospital and educate the public uh, about what's going on. Uh, I know that's easy to say, and, but I think that we've heard this morning and this afternoon that we haven't done a very good job of it despite our best intentions. More importantly, uh, I'm sorry, a larger scale of the problem, I think, is really accepting, and I, I heard all day long that we're having trouble accepting this, really accepting that what's new about this is that it's not about dirtier hospitals. It's not about better recognition of infections in hospitals. It's a community-based epidemic. The hospital problem has always been there. It needs attention, it needs work, it needs to be enhanced. 
but the community problem is new. And um, we have, um, uh, we're a very wealthy country, and we have the ability to resource these things and create programs to ask the research questions to find out what we need to know, and then the interventions to act. What's happened is we don't have the, the knowledge base. And so when a case comes from a school, they close it and disinfect it. Well, people are angry and upset. Those are natural kinds of impulses, but they won't help control MRSA epidemics in the community to appreciable extent. So what can you do? I think that you can say there is an epidemic on, it's in the community, and we need resources to deal with it. We need the CDC to mobilize and say this is a problem now. New programs, new money directed at this and other antibiotic resistance infections as well. We need the NIH to ask what are the science questions that we need to know. Someone asked this morning, this afternoon, how are these strains causing this trouble in the community? What do they have? Those are basic science questions, but we need to know them. Perhaps they're vaccine targets when we find out the answers. So NIH also needs to create programs that says there's a community MRSA epidemic on, antibiotic resistance is a problem, we need expanded programs to deal with it. The STAR bill is one way to do it, it's a good way to do it, uh, but there's other ways. And so what can you do? I think that you can say this is an epidemic and it needs attention and it needs it now. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Walsh. And then, uh, in addition to the ones I already gave, I know that you had distributed this morning a card and it was a sample of something that had been distributed to hospitals throughout the country. And someone raised the question, do you have something similar that's been developed for schools, a tip sheet? Um, and uh, the doctor said, well, we could, that's a good idea. We could see if we could try to locate resources for that. So again, from my perspective as a school person, that to me would be an outstanding thing to have and probably fairly easy to do if there was just the money to put it together and distribute it. So sometimes simple things can really help tremendously uh, inform the public, especially from a school perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gale, and very quickly. Um, yes. I would, I would say that um, you need to be able to identify these right at the, the, um, the, the community-based centers. And the only way to do this is through syndromic surveillance. And I'll give you an example. I work in Park Chester section of the Bronx. And this past summer, there was at least three cases of Legionnaire's disease that were identified. Um, because we are hooked into the, the New York City Department of Health, once they were notified that there was a cluster of that particular infection in that particular community, they sent out a bulletin immediately to my two medical centers in that community and says, this is what we're seeing. Look for these signs for Legionnaire's disease. So each time a patient presented with symptoms that looked like Legionnaire's disease, there was a best practice alert that popped up on the computer screen that says, think of this as a possibility for this particular patient. And so the doctor had it right there in front of his, his, find, his mind while he's seen the patient whether or not this particular case could have been a Legionnaire's case. So syndromic surveillance right at the point of care where you, you get information from the, the, the communities as what's happening now and then sending out the information to the respective centers in that particular community uh, could go a great deal of um, help in identifying cases early. Okay. Thank you. Quickly, two areas. One, CDC does have money for some surveillance given to local and state um, health departments for surveillance and teaching about antibiotic resistance. But frankly, it's not enough. There aren't, there, there are limited funding for those positions in the state and local health departments. And I think it's extremely important to better delineate the epidemiology, who's getting this disease, but not just the basic demographics of who's getting disease, but being able to interview the patients themselves and ask about the risk factors, their practices, their behaviors that may be underlying why they're getting that disease. So CDC needs additional funds to be able to distribute out to better do those studies and also to support surveillance. And the second area really comes down to hospital MRSA. Uh, Dr. Daum has talked about the new epicenter of this, um, of this disease being in the community, but still, as of this point, 85 percent of MRSA, at least the invasive MRSA, is hospitals. Right now in the local health departments, we inspect restaurants far more regularly than we inspect hospitals. That's true at a national level as well. We'll inspect restaurants one to four times a year. We inspect hospitals once every three years. I think more resources to inspect hospitals to, in order to help them 
have better oversight, that they meet those infection control standards that we know, if applied, will decrease MRSA and other infections. Thank you. Now I yield to the ranking member. It's all yours. Thank you. I'll try to be brief, but I very much appreciate what this panel has had to offer. Um, Dr. Burns, the emergency reporting requirements that were issued a uh, few weeks ago require the labs to do the reporting. How did Virginia officials settle on that as being the best means uh, for tracking? Um, it, it, as you can imagine, it did take a lot of uh, debate and discussion to, to decide on the most efficient method to do it. Uh, but it came down to the fact that to diagnose MRSA, you have to have a laboratory test. So you can't, it's not a clinical diagnosis, it's a laboratory diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So since it's a laboratory diagnosis, why make the doctor report it when the laboratory already has the data and laboratories are generally much more oriented towards just adding another disease to the list of diseases they report and then it happens automatically. There's not a one at a time yeah. kind of situation. So it's, it's cheap. It's exactly the data we want. It's effective. It's, the system's already in place. It was easy. What do we do with the data reported? Are school districts made aware of the reported cases? Well, um, what, what we're asking the um, labs to report is MRSA from a, from a normally sterile um, part of the body. So it doesn't include all the skin and, and superficial infections. So we're looking at bone, bloodstream, things like that. <clears throat> We, we don't anticipate that this will be a tool that will be useful at the school level, but we do think that it will be useful um, in, in helping us keep track of the, of the tip of the iceberg and it, it, by, by understanding what the tip of the iceberg is doing both over time and by location, we can better um, target our deeper investigations to see what's actually going on. And the, the thing I forgot to mention earlier about the other reason why it's real attractive to do the laboratory data is in public health, we always like to know the denominator. We, we like to know the, something about the population that the number of diseases comes from. So if you just take the number of diseases coming into the emergency room and you haven't thought about what part of the community they represent, you really kind of just have a popularity contest about who goes to that hospital. So by doing this laboratory-based reporting, we know that we have the entire universe, and so we will have valid data for us to make conclusions on over time. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dom, um, you mentioned in your testimony that the skin and the soft tissue infections associated with MRSA often resemble spider bites. Now, if a physician were to look at this, uh, this skin infection is a spider bite and treat it that way, is that a potentially fatal misstep for the patient? So um, it is true that uh, spider bites are commonly the story that patients will tell who come in with a community MRSA skin and soft tissue infection. Um, I had a slide, but not enough time to show it today, uh, that shows the mismatch of where epidemic disease is occurring and where those kinds of spiders live uh, in our country. And um, it's amusing to hear in Chicago where the spiders do not live, uh, how often patients will nevertheless tell you that this started with a spider bite. And, and what I've learned to do then is say, have you seen the spider? And the answer is no. Um, so I guess it's recognition of something that looks like a spider bite in a place where they don't live uh, is helpful. There's a bit of a conundrum here because when anything that breaks the skin, including an insect bite, can actually uh, predispose to staphylococcal infection. Staph loves, unbro loves broken skin. So that it's possible that a spider bite uh, in the sections of the country where they do live uh, could, in fact, uh, set off a community MRSA infection as well. So I think a physician has to be concerned uh, when he or she sees uh, something that looks like a spider bite that this could be a community MRSA infection. I think that your question, though, goes to an issue of progression. And um, in a skin and soft tissue infection, um, a very, very small percentage of them progress to more severe disease. So that I think that um, uh, physicians need to be thoughtful about what they're seeing, but that an abscess does not today does not mean you're going to have a severe sepsis tomorrow. I just, I, I'm just confused on one last thing. This is kind of my last question. Dr. Gerberding in the first panel talked about how these staph uh, 
these terms are everywhere. They're in people's noses and all of it. And, and you're talking about how they're more regional in their manifestations. So um, we're both right. Um, well, Dr. Durbin, I knew that. I'm just trying to <laughs> get it together and understand how you were both right. So st Staphylococcus aureus, which is what we're really talking about today, and MRSA is a subset of those, okay, um, is a very well-adapted human pathogen. My guess is if the history book could be opened, it's been living in us and on us uh, for centuries. Um, and, that, and a well-adapted pathogen doesn't want to kill everybody. I mean, it's the last thing in the world it would want to do uh, because then it has no place to live. So what staff really are happiest doing is living in your nose usually, but could be on your skin uh, or even somewhere else rarely, um, and just sit there. Eat what you eat, breathe what you breathe, uh, and, and its ultimate goal, divide. Um, it really doesn't want to cause uh, disease. Disease is an unfortunate result of a breakdown between our body's defenses and the germ's ability to live on us in peace. So uh, most, uh, Dr. Gerberding is absolutely right. Staph aureus, Staphylococcus aureus is everywhere. About a third of us right now have it on our bodies even though presumably none of us have skin and soft tissue infections. And that's true. That's changed a little bit because now there's sometimes MRSA methicillin resistant staph aureus, but it's the same staph aureus. Uh, and disease is, a, is an uncommon, any disease is an uncommon outcome of interaction between this bug and one of us. It, it likes to just live peace, peacefully among us. So I, I think that goes to your question um, uh, that Chief sort of posed. The, the difference is, is if they perceive that they're not, um, uh, have enough food, they perceive that the conditions where they're living aren't the right ones, then they begin to secrete their toxins and begin to destroy tissue. The body then begins to respond to it and you get something that a doctor would call an infection. Gotcha, thank you. That's it. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just say that um, uh, the chairman has indicated that we'll have another hearing in the spring, you know, while uh, of course uh, on hospital acquired uh, MRSA and resistant strains. I also would like to thank all the witnesses uh, for the testimony, and I hope that this hearing has provided some comfort to the public that while MRSA is a genuine concern, there are some practical, simple steps that people can take to protect themselves and their children. At the same time, the witnesses have made a very compelling case that we have to do more to combat infections in the community and in the healthcare setting. And also that we need to take the issue of antibiotics resistance very seriously. I look forward to pursuing these issues in the coming months. And as I said, that uh, there will be another hearing in the spring. Without objections, the committee stands adjourned.